call the meeting to order. I'd uh, first like to introduce the newest member of the zoning board, um, Aaron Mosher. It's uh, his first day here. Um, and I think we can then move right along to approving the minutes from the March 25th, 2014 meeting. Uh, any discussion on the minutes? I wasn't here for that meeting, so I'm going to abstain. Okay. We only have three people who are here at that meeting. It is not a quorum. All right, so we will table that until the next meeting. Do we need a motion to table that? All right. Um, we're going to skip over the old business, um, and we'll take that up at the next meeting. Um, so we're going to go right to D, new business, which is uh, the first Issue is to hear the request of Verizon Wireless and New Singular Wireless PCS LLC for an administrative appeal of the code enforcement officer's decision to deny each of their building permit applications to add wireless telecommu telecommunication antennas and associated equipment buildings on the Portland Water District property at 11 Avon Road, map U12, lot 12. The two applications are very similar, and the applicants have requested to be heard as one agenda item. Um, I'd first like to start, uh, as we usually do, by asking uh, Ben to just quickly summarize um, this uh, matter, and then we'll uh, move forward and have the uh, um, interested parties uh, make presentations. Uh, last summer, I began communicating with representatives from both Verizon and AT&T about the possibility of uh, placing cellular antennas uh, on the water tower uh, at, on Avon Road and, uh, and then the associated mechanical structures on the ground. Uh, we first discussed the antennas being allowed based on the water tower being an alternative tower structure and uh, in that it, and, and it was denied on that basis August 23rd of 2013. I wrote a letter outlining why it can't be an alternative tower structure. And next we began discussing whether the so-called Spectrum Act preempted local zoning and would allow the co-location uh, based on that. And um, I made a decision on March 19th of this year that it did not comply with the requirements of the Spectrum Act to preempt our local zoning. Okay. Um, I guess we'll move on to Verizon Attorney Anderson. Great. All right. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, everyone. Um, Scott Anderson with Verizon Wireless, and I'm here this evening also with Chip Fredette uh, with Vital Site Services. He's uh, responsible for identifying sites um, for potential uh, new wireless facilities, and then the two of us work together on permitting. And as Ben mentioned, um, we've got two uh, proposed carriers that are seeking to go on the Portland Water District water tower. Um, and so for the sake of you know, bringing these issues before you at the same time, we're kind of consolidating these two, excuse me, these two appeals um, as the, a lot of the issues are overlap and are very similar. Uh, so with AT&T, we have Barry Hobbins and Robert Gashlin who are here with AT&T. Um, for the most part, I'll kind of walk through what the primary issues are as they apply to both facilities. But in the event that I miss something or there's something specific to the AT&T site, Barry can pop up and kind of uh, give you any additional information or make any corrections uh, on any of the issues um, that I'm discussing that might be different as applying to the AT&T site. So um, I have just what hopefully is a brief presentation for your benefit to talk about kind of what the big issues are in this appeal. Um, this is uh, for your benefit. I know you've read the materials and please feel free you can kind of wait to the end and ask me any questions you may have. But if uh, questions arise as I'm going through the presentation, please feel free to stop me and go ahead and, and ask your questions. Um, 
there are uh, several primary issues that I'm going to go through in the presentation. Um, first, I'm going to talk about the coverage gap in this area of Cape Elizabeth and the improved service that will come with the proposed Verizon site. We're going to talk a lot, I think, about co-location because in this case, there is a municipal law issue and there's a federal law issue, but both of these issues are in the context of co-location, uh, meaning use of existing structures to hang new uh, wireless telecommunication facilities. So the municipal issue, as you know, comes down to the interpretation of the term alternative tower structure in your ordinance and whether or not the water tank fits that definition. And then we're going to talk a little bit about the Spectrum Act, which is the federal provision that um, was enacted in 2012 to expedite permitting of uh, co-locations on existing structures. So the first, this isn't really relevant to the, to, to the ordinance or the, the federal law interpretations, but there are some other materials that I know have been provided to the uh, board with regard to the need for this facility. So I've got two plots. This is the before plot that shows what the Verizon wireless coverage is in Cape Elizabeth today. And it is coverage that is provided by two sites, one a site up in uh, South Portland, and the other is uh, one of the existing towers, I believe it was an existing tower back in 2000, when you enacted the provisions in your ordinance that apply to wireless facilities, and we are on that one tower. That tower is in one of the three locations where you can actually put a new tower in the town of Cape Elizabeth. So as you can see, the green areas are areas um, in which there is adequate service coverage, and um, the lighter shaded areas um, are where we don't have adequate coverage. And so that's the before, and this is the after, showing the addition of um, the antennas on the tank on Avon Road. Um, so again, that's what it looks like today, and that's the coverage that will be provided by this site. There were some materials that were provided to the board. Um, I think they were taken off the website of Verizon Wireless and AT&T. Um, those uh, are kind of done uh, to show general coverage areas. There's uh, explicit kind of a warning language at the bottom that this does not actually capture what the actual coverage is. Most importantly and most simply, those plots assume that Cape Elizabeth is perfectly flat. So there's no consideration of topography or tree cover. And the areas where we have problems in coverage are areas that are on the other side of higher points of Cape Elizabeth, and that's why the coverage is blocked, and that's why when we put a site in this general vicinity of Avon Road, it will fill in those coverage gaps. So uh, the <clears throat> kind of stepping back, the big issue here is co-location. Um, there are two components to every wireless site. Um, there are antennas that broadcast the signal, and then we need a structure to place those antennas. Um, for Verizon Wireless and AT&T, we are in the business of installing antennas. That's what carries the signal and receives the signal from the phones. And we will work with any structure that is available to hang the antennas. There are um, tower companies that put up towers and they try to negotiate deals with carriers to locate their antennas on their towers. But our focus is always on the antennas and um, how do we get our antennas up and running in the places where people need service on whatever structure is available. So this distinction between the antennas and the, and the structure that the antennas are mounted on is important and will come up quite a bit. So co-location allows carriers to close coverage gaps without the use of new structures. Um, and uh, that is something that is required by our FCC license. We've got obligations to um, be reasonable and assist other carriers with going on our towers, and the same is true uh, the other way. Um, we've got master tower agreements with some of the tower companies. The focus um, uh, on co-location comes down to the FCC license requirements as well. And obviously this is preferred by us, it is preferred by towns, it allows us to provide better service um, while minimizing the number of new structures in town necessary to provide that service. So back in 2000, your ordinance has a number of provisions that both encourage and require co-location. This is all from section 19.8.12 of your ordinance. So anyone that's building a new tower has to make sure that they're making accommodations for future carriers to locate on that tower. Um, to ensure this, the town may require co-location on a tower in order to prevent the need for a subsequent applicant that, that would come in and would propose a new tower. Meaning, if there is existing towers and existing structures in town, 
then normally your planning board would require someone proposing a new tower to show why they can't go on someone else's structure before they would allow any new towers to be built. And in fact, the, the planning board has the right to deny an application if you're not making adequate provisions for uh, arrangement of co-location. And in fact, may require someone who already has a permit to extend their tower height in order to make provisions for co-location. Again, to avoid um, a new tower from being constructed. Finally, the provision that we'll talk about in a bit, alternative tower structure, um, allows uh, carriers to place antennas in many more zoning districts in town while new towers are very much restricted and actually limited to three sites in town. Um, the benefits of co-location co are recognized by other towns, and there's a couple of different ways they do this. One, with expedited permitting, both Kennebunk and Camden, you only need to go to the code enforcement officer if you're co-locating, but if you're going to do a new tower, you've got to go to the planning board. Some towns have flat exemptions. Bar Harbor has an exemption for any wireless facility that is integrated into an existing or proposed structure, including church steeples, water towers, flagpoles, and the like. Uh, in that case, the site plan review standards of the, of the Bar Harbor wireless ordinance don't even apply. And then as uh, with Cape Elizabeth, Yarmouth has a similar provision where if you're co-locating on an existing alternative tower structure, you can go pretty much everywhere in town while new towers are restricted. Um, finally, the, the federal government has got involved in the co-location game really for two reasons. One, there's been a recognition that when you have an existing structure and you've got antennas on that structure, that the incremental impact of adding another set of antennas is not significant. Um, and there's been the focus under the Telecommunications Act, and there's really two provisions here. Um, the Telecommunications Act prohibits towns from discriminating among service providers. Um, this resulted, and some issues with this resulted in a 2009 declaratory ruling. What, what was happening was towns were prohibiting new carriers from coming in on the basis that, say, AT&T was already pro providing coverage in a town, so Verizon Wireless or T-Mobile weren't allowed to come in. And the FCC recognized that all of the carriers needed access to these municipalities. They've got different plans, and it's a kind of a free market situation. So one of the ways in which the, the Telecommunications Act focuses on co-location is when you have a tower that's being used by a carrier, there are certain limits on denying other carriers the right to go on those towers. Um, also, just recently, the FCC created this thing called the Shot Clock, which was a rulemaking that they did uh, that imposed a 150-day time limit for towns acting on new towers, um, but only 90 days to act on co-location. Again, the concept here is that when you have a co-location, the impacts are more minor. Um, the shot clock with a shorter time frame for co-location was done both to encourage carriers to use existing structures as opposed to building new towers and to kind of streamline permitting at the municipal level. Um, in addition, there was, and this is kind of important because it will come up later, um, for new towers, let's say you have a new tower that's next to a historic church. Um, that new tower has got to go through some sort of assessment to evaluate what impact that new tower will have on that historic structure. So uh, several years ago, the FCC and the Advisory Council for Historic Preservation, the one that kind of governs the, this, what's called Section 106 process, um, did a nationwide agreement where they agreed that for co-locations, uh, the addition of these antennas on existing structures was not likely to be adverse to um, adjacent um, historic structure. So they came up with a kind of streamlined approach um, where so long as you're not substantially changing the, the size of the existing tower that you are um, not required to go through the full-blown um, 106 process and, and consultation on impacts of historic structures. And again, that, that agreement was reached with the understanding that co-locations have minimal impacts on abutting uses and we're not likely to have an adverse impact on historic structures. And then finally, most recently in 2012, the Section 6409 of the Spectrum Act was enacted, and we'll talk about that in a bit, but that is another piece that focuses on limiting um, and streamlining permitting for co-locating on existing structures. So the first issue, again, is a town issue. We have a provision in your ordinance that allows 
mounting of new wireless antennas on an alternative tower structure. So the definition of this term is mounting structures such as, but not limited to, clock towers, bell steeples, utility and light poles, and water towers that conceal the presence of the antennas and which are used primarily for purposes other than to support an antenna. So our interpretation of this ordinance is two primary piece, pieces. First, we have to show that there's concealment. And second, we have to show that the existing alternative tower structure has a primary purpose other than to hang the proposed antennas that we're proposing to hang on the tower. So there's two pieces. First, for concealment, and there are photo simulations, and I've just picked the two out of the application packet. Here's a photo of the existing tower as it stands today. And this is the simulation showing the addition of the facility. Um, there's two primary components. You can see up on the railing on the top are the antennas. We have proposed to cover them with a shroud to, um, to hide the fact that they are antennas. Um, and also the second structure is the equipment shelter down at the base of the tower. Normally that's a prefabricated kind of brick stucco flat roofed um, structure. Uh, we're proposing to do it with wood clabberds and a peaked roof, so it's kind of more keeping with a residential shed. Um, but this is the, the kind of shielding that we have proposed. Again, that's the, that's the current view, and then that's the after view. Um, I think Ben noted in his decision that there is a provision for alternative tower structures where if he goes that route, Ben can take a look and say, yep, those are concealed, you're good. Or if he looks at it and he says, you know what, I'm not really sure that that's concealed enough, he can refer the matter to the planning board. We didn't get to that provision here because he concluded that the structure didn't meet the definition, but th that is conceivably something that you could do or something if you agreed and granted the appeal on any basis and it went back to Ben, it might be a situation where we'd go back to the planning board and talk a little bit more about these components. Um, this is what we had kind of proposed out of the box. It might be that the, the Ben or the planning board would prefer a flat roof or prefer a brick or a color that matched the existing building um, or that the shrouds provided too much volume and that it would be better just to put the antennas up. So this was our proposal, but of course it, it, it really didn't get to the discussion phase with anyone and, and we're certainly willing to kind of talk about tweaks to that that either Ben or the planning board uh, would think would be helpful here. Is that second visual simula simulation showing both installations or just Verizon? That's, not, that's just the Verizon installation. I'm not sure if AT&T did photo sims. Um, this was the one that we had submitted with the building permit application. All right, so the second piece is really the, the issue for this alternative tower structure provision, and it's the primary purpose language. Um, and for there, I think we need to talk a little bit about the tank, because this is a somewhat unusual situation. So the Portland Water District tank was built in 1945, so it's almost 70 years old. And over that time frame, it has performed two critical functions for the town of Cape Elizabeth. So from 1945 to 2007, it provided backup water storage, primarily for the fire protection system in this area of Cape Elizabeth. Um, now what happened was, I mean, there's some, a letter from the Portland Water District that was submitted as part of the application. They did an upgrade in 2005 and 2006 to the um, pipe system in, in the town, and they no longer needed um, the water storage for fire protection because they had an upgrade to the system. So um, for this time period from 1945 to 2007, that was the first uh, function that it performed. Starting in 85, about 20 years before the water was removed from the tank, um, the water district installed its SCADA antenna on the tank, which, was, uh, which is currently used and still currently used to communicate with 27 sewer pump stations and the Cape Elizabeth treatment plant. Um, so, and those kind of two critical functions are independent and separate and they overlapped by about 20 years. Um, now, what happened in 2007 when um, the water district realized that it didn't need the backup water storage anymore, but it did need the antennas, is it went and talked to the town about what its options were. Uh, but at that point in time, the Cape Elizabeth zoning ordinance kind of dictated the result here. Um, enacted in the year 2000, as you know, it prohibits new towers in the residential A district in this area of town. So the water district actually was required to keep the tank up because the, um, it wasn't a permitted use to build 
a new tower in this area. They needed the antennas in this area for the proper functioning of the sewer system and the treatment plant, and they didn't have any other options to locate their antennas. So they kept the tank in place. Uh, my understanding also is that there had been in 2000 quite a contentious rezoning a discussion in the town, uh, setting aside only those three lots where you could put a new tower and the water district was encouraged by the town not to seek rezoning of the residential aid district at that time because they, it hadn't been that long since they had just gone through the rezoning. Um, so at that point in time, uh, the tank was no longer used for water storage, but it has and continues to perform a critical function for this water utility, and that is communicating with the, the pump uh, stations and the treatment plant. And one of the, the letters that was sent along to Ben earlier last year, because we were asking them to comment, um, and they stated the district at this point in time doesn't intend to use the water tank for water storage again, again, because they've done an upgrade of the piping system, but it's going to be continued to be used by the district for the communications antenna, which is an important part of the function of the sewer treatment system. So the primary purpose piece, what, what really happened was, and I kind of appreciate Ben's kind of digging into this and trying to sort it out. And uh, also, I just want to note that although we're kind of technically dragging Ben in front of the ZBA here, um, he has been very cooperative. And I, th you know, we've been trying to give information and kind of sort these things out. And I certainly appreciate his kind of time and thoughts and trying to figure out what makes sense here. But the the big hang up was is the fact that the water is no longer in the tank, does that somehow mean that the primary purpose provision of the alternative tower structure definition is thrown out the window and we can't go here? So the real issue is discontinued, discontinued use of some of these older structures that the alternative tower structure definition identifies as potential um, uh, places to locate new antennas. And Chip and I have done um, a number of Bell Steeple sites in Camden and other towns um, and, and what we see is whether it's a clock tower or a Bell Steeple, most of these structures no longer function in the way that they were functioning when they were first created. The bells are gone, the clocks don't work. But the idea here is, is not that the town kind of digs underneath and tries to evaluate whether someone who has a structure is using it the way it was initially built for, whether it's the highest and best use or the proper use, but the focus is whether or not you have an existing structure. Because the purpose of this alternative tower structure provision is to allow carriers to provide better coverage without having to build anything new without having to build any new structures in the town of Cape Elizabeth. And it's an important part of your ordinance because new towers are only allowed on three lots kind of running down the center of the town. And when you've got issues where you've got to fill in coverage in other areas, the carriers really need to rely on these alternative tower structures. And again, the, the concept is don't build something new, use something that's already there. So it really begs the question, what is the purpose of the primary purpose requirement? And here's what it is, and I've got a bunch of pictures here. So that's a cactus and that's a lighthouse, but that's not a cactus and that's not a lighthouse. Those are both cell phone towers that were built to look like other things that didn't exist on the day those carriers came to town and had to build something. So there is a lovely farm and a barn with a silo that didn't exist until several carriers needed to put a structure up. And you can see why they do this. It allows you to blend something into the landscape. It doesn't look like a cell phone tower, um, but you're allowed to provide coverage. That is not a buffalo. That is a cell phone tower, but it's on a hill that will look like a buffalo if you're driving by on the highway. Um, we've got flagpoles. Um, these are actually quite common. Um, again, these structures didn't exist before the cell phone company came to town. Um, they just needed something that looked like something other than a tower to hang their antennas. Now, this is a site in New Hampshire. Uh, again, it looks like a fire tower. Those windows are painted on to the outside. Um, the carrier was asked to do something that looked like a fire tower to hide the fact that it was a cell phone tower. Um, but that fire tower um, has never functioned as such. And this is the best one. So this is in Southern California. Um, this is an artificial, old school looking water tank. And the uh, local historic society actually made them put that picture on top of Kali something that was a local business because they wanted to blend into the local community. So this happens all the time. 
carriers come in and build brand new structures that are made to look like other things in order to hide the cell phone towers. And for a lot of towns, they like that. But your ordinance is different. Your alternative tower structure provision states that the structure that you're going on has to have a primary purpose other than putting antennas in it. And we believe that's what the intent of that language is and that's how it should be interpreted. So here we don't have this situation with a brand new water tank that essentially becomes a brand new structure. We have an existing tank that has been in this neighborhood for 70 years and we're not having to make that tank any taller. We're not having to make that tank any bigger. We're going to paint it. The structure that we put down for the equipment at the base is going to be made to look like a residential shed. We're taking advantage of an existing structure in order to provide um, solid new coverage without having to introduce a new, um, a new construction into the community. And you can imagine what would happen if you didn't have that primary purpose provision and there was no water tank here. We could come to you and say, look, Portland Water District owns some land at the end of Avon Road. We're going to put a fake water tank up there because it's a water district and they have water tanks all over the place. The neighbors would appropriately in that case say, absolutely not. You're putting a brand new structure up. Again, that's what we think the purpose is of that primary purpose provision. It's to make sure that we're using existing structures whenever possible. All right, so that's the local um, ordinance provision. And we think that the tank qualifies as an alternative tower structure because we've made provisions to conceal the, the facility. And the primary purpose of that tank is not to provide AT&T or Verizon Wireless with a site to hang its antenna, antennas. And for that reason, we think that just under your zoning ordinance, this is an allowed use and it would be a building permit issued by Ben. The second piece is the Spectrum Act piece uh, and the, Sorry. yes, go ahead. Before sure. you move on to the federal sure. piece, can you just discuss why this is an accessory use under um, 19.6.1? So, I mean, it's, this, this type of use would only be allowed as an accessory use in the RA zone, is that correct? I, well, actually, I don't think so. I think if you look at the list of allowed uses in the RA zone, the first category are the, um, let me see, I've got the reference here. I think it's the table. 1961. Uh, 56. 56, 57. So in the discussion of the allowed uses in the RA zone, the first section is um, re uh, allowed uses that are uh, permitted in the RP1, 2, and 3 zone that are listed on table 1969. And this is common in ordinances. You know, you start with a residential district, which is a relatively restrictive district. The first set of land uses are those that are already allowed in an even more restrictive district, which is the RP 1, 2, and 3. So if you then go to Table 19.6.9 in the ordinance, public utilities and essential utility services are a permitted use in the resource protection district. So kind of by incorporating that table into the RA district, the tank, the antennas, both of those have been uh, public utility uh, facilities and meet the definition of essential services that is under your ordinance. So uh, from our reading of the ordinance, the, the antennas are an allowed use. So you're saying under 1961B1A? Yeah, let me see. As a resource-related use? Yes, and then it cross-references the it, table right. 1969. <laughs> But essentially your position is that the reason they're permitted is because the cell tower is an essential service or a public utility. No, no. I mean, I, I think in talking about whether the tank and the antennas are currently an allowed use or a non-conforming use, I think, is the, is the question. The um, question was, why is this a permissible accessory use? And then you said that it was not an accessory use, it was a permissible use. The, 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 cell phone installation was a permissible use. Oh, no, no, sorry. Um, um, so I thought the question was the existing antennas, the Portland Water District antennas, no. are they an accessory use? No. Okay. So, so if we meet the definition of an alternative tower structure, then in the RA zone, um, uh, co-locating antennas on an alternative tower structure is a permitted use in the residential A district. Um, so we appreciate that there is this issue about whether this is an alternative tower structure. Um, uh, a permitted accessory use? Let me just see here. Uh, 
Yeah, and this, so this would be a permitted accessory use to the existing primary use, which is the use of the tank by the Portland Water District as essential services or a public utility. So that, that would be under 1961B4G. That's correct. Is that the accessory use for, uh, yes. Uh, the following accessory use is commercial wireless telecommunications service antenna which is attached to an alternative tower structure in a manner which conceals the presence of an antenna. That's correct. And in every zoning district in which an alternative tower structure mount is allowed, you are, it's always going to be an accessory use because, remember, you have to have that structure serving a primary purpose for something other than Verizon Wireless or AT&T loading their antennas on it. So in, in, in every situation, it, it would be an accessory use um, to the primary use, which is what the, what the tower is being, you know, what the water tower is be, being used for right now. So, so you're saying that the primary use right now is supporting the water district. That's antennas. correct. And Which is an essential service or a public utility use. That's correct. The wireless antennas will be an accessory use to that primary use? That's correct. Okay. So then turning to the Spectrum Act, so uh, in 2012, um, the Spectrum Act is really doing two things. Primarily, the Spectrum Act is about the FCC making available um, broader bands of spectrum to enhance broadband coverage in the United States. There's a recognition that people don't use their phones for just cell phone calls anymore. They don't even just use it for texting, that people are using their phones to download significant amounts of data and that the uh, broadband network is, is not sufficient to, to carry that load. So in 2012, uh, Congress uh, stated that a state or local government may not deny and shall approve any eligible facilities request for a modification of an existing wireless tower or base station that does not substantially change the physical dimensions of that tower or base station. Um, and as with your state law, the municipal law provision, there are really two key pieces here where there's a dispute. One, what constitutes an existing wireless tower or base station? And here it's really a base station for obvious reasons. And second, does our installation substantially change the physical dimensions of that base station? So um, tower, and, and so what's happened here is Congress passes this law in 2012, and the FCC issued a guidance document that next January, which has been pointed out by some others, doesn't have the rule of law, and the FCC admits that. What the guidance document is, is an indication from the FCC about what they think these terms mean. They're, of course, free to change their mind and litigation and do different things. But at, that point, but at this point in time, we only have two documents out there. We have the statute itself, and then we have the guidance document. Um, and as John pointed out in his letter to the town, you know, it's, it's a guidance document. It's, it's Mendes guidance. It's not binding. Um, but it gives an indication as to what the FCC th th thinks these terms uh, mean. Um, and as I kind of talk about these, I think you'll understand why the definitions that are in this guidance document are consistent with the whole purpose and point of the Spectrum Act provision and what it's trying to accomplish. So they've noted in the guidance document that a, a tower is any structure built for the sole primary purpose of support, supporting FCC licensed antennas. What's important about that is there are two types of FCC licensed antennas that are relevant to what's happening here. One are called personal wireless facilities. Those are cell phone um, towers, uh, FCC licensed facilities. Um, ones that are not referred to as personal wireless facilities, that means it's a commercial um, FCC licensed antenna for some other use, not for cell phone use. And in the FCC guidance, they talk about this distinction and that Congress used, um, did not use the term personal wireless uh, facility, it used wireless. And in doing so, intended as the starting point, when you're trying to figure out what's a tower or a base station that's subject to this law, it is not limited to cell phone towers. It, is, it includes any structure and it will include towers and base stations upon which you have an FCC licensed antenna. Now, base station, admittedly, is the one that has the least amount of detail in it, mostly because the term tower has been defined in several um, rulemakings, but the term base station hasn't been defined as a standalone term. It has been defined in the context of some rules, but it hasn't been defined in the kind of just as a standalone generic uh, term. So at this point in time, the FCC has indicated that it is a structure 
that currently supports or houses an antenna, transceiver, or other associated equipment that constitutes part of that base station. All right, so what, what the heck is a base station? Okay, hub and spoke. A base station, in its generic understanding, is the central facility that communicates with multiple other devices. These can be mobile, they can be fixed. But a base station is the central, provision, central facility that is communicating and coordinating signals with a number of other remote locations. Here, things at the end of the spoke. It could be a cell phone tower with a bunch of people driving around. It can be fixed sites. The concept of the base station is that it is the place that communicates with lots of other places. Someone had suggested, hey, what about smart meters? Well, smart meters are the spoke. That's the thing that communicates. Those things are two feet off the ground. That communicates with the central base station or with the meter reader who's driving around taking your meters using the, um, the, using the smart meter. So um, the concept of a base station is it's the central area that's communicating with others. And here's why the base station is there. Here's the issue. If you have a base station, you already have a structure. And you have a structure that is likely to be tall enough and in a location where it can communicate with multiple variable other devices, which is exactly what you're looking for if you're going to co-locate a wireless um, for AT&T or Verizon Wireless. So they're using the concept of base station because these devices are like, these sites are likely to be potential co-location sites. Um, and because the focus of the Spectrum Act is to limit town's permitting authority when you have an existing structure and you don't have to build a new structure because everyone agrees it's better to do it that way, that's the context in which you've got to read this base station piece. And again, it's not an issue of mobile versus fixed. Um, um, comments have been submitted to the, the, to the board about, look, every time you use base station, it's, it's, it says it's commuting, uh, communicating with mobile units. That's because those regulatory provisions in which the term base station is defined are provisions that deal with mobile telecommunications provisions, either the licensing of spectrum or co-locating and other things. So it's been defined in the regs in, in the context of mobile because that's what those regulations deal with. All right, so we've got what we think is a base station. It's a base station because it communicates with 27 different pumping stations in the wastewater treatment plant, which means it's at the top of a hill, which of course this is, and it's on top of a tower that's broad enough that it's a potential co-location provision. So that's why we think this is a base station that was intended in, in Congress's act. The next piece is substantial change. So the FCC in its guidance document has identified four factors. One. You can't increase the height of the structure by more than 10% or 20 feet, whichever is greater. We're not making the water tank any taller at all. It remains exactly the same height it is. Second, you don't need more than one equipment shelter or four equipment cabinets. The equipment shelter is really the big piece. I think we've got two equipment cabinets, that, the telco cabinet, where it takes the, the power from the pole and steps it down and does what it needs to before it goes into the equipment shelter. Um, the reason why this is deemed not a substantial change is because pretty much every wireless facility needs an equipment shelter. Um, sometimes, if you're doing a church, you can put it in the basement. Um, but in most facilities, you need to have an external equipment shelter. Um, and if, so long as you only have one, then that's deemed not a substantial change. Third, you can't have your antennas hanging out more than 20 feet. Our antennas are less than 10 feet away from the, the side of the tank. And of course, they're less than that from the railing that surrounds the side of the tank. But even from the solid form of the structure, we're not even 10 feet away from the tank. And finally, no excavation outside the current tower site. So we're adding an equipment shelter within the land and the property already owned by the Portland Water District. We're not needing to lease or grab any additional land in order to construct this um, facility. So those are the four criteria that the FCC currently uses um, to determine what's a substantial change. Um, and although this was in a guidance document as well, these have a little more weight behind them because these factors were included in that um, uh, programmatic agreement I talked about earlier with the National Historic Preservation folks where they concluded that if you meet those four standards, then you don't have to go through the full uh, historic review uh, process if you're next to um, uh, you know, a church that's listed or eligible for listing. Um, so although they have not been defined in rule in the context of the Spectrum Act, um, uh, they have been uh, set in rule in a very similar provision. Um, that programmatic agreement 
is trying to identify projects that don't have a significant impact on abutting properties. Historic in that situation. Here, it, in this case, it's residential. Um, and we think that those are reasonable um, um, conditions in evaluating a substantial change. And we note that we're not even coming close to, to any of those. Um, so in summary, um, where we are is this facility is going to address a significant gap in coverage without us having to construct a new tower or another structure in the town of Cape Elizabeth. We believe that the water tank is an alternative tower structure on your ordinance and as such it is a permitted use that is uh, permitted by the code enforcement officer potentially with some consultation from the planning board on the concealment provision. And in the alternative, it's an eligible facility as that term is used in the Spectrum Act. And as a result, what the CEO would look at in permitting of any eligible facility is um, to confirm that you've got an existing base station and that there isn't a substantial change uh, in the impact to the tower. Um, there have been a number of other issues that have kind of been raised by other parties. My sense is to see if you have any questions about what I've talked about. And um, as other folks uh, step up and have thoughts and comments, if you think there's anything that I can address uh, by way of questions, um, I would be pleased to, to do so. Um, and that is the end. Thank you, folks. Thank you. Can I jump in for yeah, a second? Before we go any further, I wanted to, I'm sorry that I didn't do this before the presentation. I um, had my recollection refreshed as you were talking that this application um, or one substantially similar to it was initially filed um, back last summer, I think. I am not a direct abutter. I do live on Trundy Road near the um, proposed project and I received a notice of a public meeting about it. I was not able to attend that meeting. I was, I have been on the other side of the table in my professional career with um, Attorney Anderson on a fairly regular basis. At that time, it, the application was not before us. Um, in fact, I don't know that it was before anyone. I sent him an email and said, can you send me the SIMS and the plans for the project? I'm not gonna be able to go to the meeting. That was the extent of our communication. I don't think there's been any further communication about that with um, Attorney Anderson. I am also currently on the other side of the table from Attorney Hobbins um, with regard to negotiation, representing a, munis a different municipality other than the town of Cape um, in their negotiation of a lease with AT&T. I personally don't think that either of these things rise to the level of a conflict, but I wanted to put them out there on the table um, before I participated in deliberations. The board wants to have any discussion, but I don't, I don't think it rises to the level of a conflict either, so. Thanks. Thank you. All right, so if you have any questions for me, I can answer them, or you can let other folks pop up, and I'll answer questions as it best kind of suits Yeah, are there your any thoughts. questions of the board for Attorney Anderson now, or? I just have one question. Is, back to the uh, issue of substantial change in mm -hmm. the Spectrum Act. Um, there's the issue of uh, excavation uh, outside the property. Is there, is there uh, a new utility line, an underground utility line? There won't be. Installed out to Trundy Road? To Trundy, well, to Avon Road. They'll, Avon be, Road. they'll be taking power from a pole on Avon Road. Um, that will be above ground, um, as shown in the plan. Um, the only excavation will be they will, they will pour a pad for the equipment shelter that gets mounted. Um, and there also, I think, is a... Um, external uh, propane tank um, that would also have a pad if I'm remembering that correctly. So other than a, a pad foundation for the equipment shelter, there won't be any additional excavation. They'll bump out the fence to secure the new structure and all of that work will take place on the Portland Water District's property. Thanks. I, I had one question and it relates to the definition of alternative tower structure. Sure. Um, the, the definition in the ordinance is a mounting, mounting structures such as but not limited to block towers, bell steeples, utility and light poles, and water towers that conceal the presence of antennas or towers in which are used primarily for purposes other than to support an antenna. Isn't the water tower's <laughs> primary antenna. purpose now 
supporting an antenna? Well, that's a, that's a very good question. And I think it is, it, it is kind of not the best drafted language in the provision. So there's two different ways of reading that. There's the, the way you're thinking, which is, wait a second, even if we decide that this is a utility facility, this one has an antenna on it, so that would exempt that type of alternative tower structure because that's what it's being used for. Again, for the reasons that I talked about before, because the purpose of the primary purpose provision is to prevent you from building a fake structure, a new fake structure, to conceal the antennas, what is intended there is that, that the primary purpose can't be for the antenna that is being proposed by the applicant who's trying to use the alternative tower structure. Um, it, it doesn't make any sense to read that as, well, the town of Cape Elizabeth thought it would be great to use any kind of structure that was there, and if the structure was doing 10 different things, that would be great. But if there's an antenna on it, then that structure is no longer considered. So I think you're right. If you read it literally, it looks like you have to give consideration to the fact that the water district has an antenna. But I, but I think that the only kind of reasonable, rational way to read that is that it has a primary purpose other than to support the antenna that's being proposed for that site. And this was enacted in 2007, this slang. Two, sorry, 2000, 2000, right? That's correct. Are there other water towers in town? Not that I'm aware of, but I'm not entirely sure. Okay. And this one stopped being storing water in 2007, 2007. Seven years after this was enacted. That's correct. So, I mean, to the extent the town knew, and that was a mistake that was pointed out, totally fair. I had said that, hey, the, the tank was empty at the time the ordinance was enacted. That's not true. So there was water in there. I'm not sure to what extent. I mean, when we had the public information meeting, there was a lot of confusion about whether there was water in the tank or not, so I'm not sure when the town knew about that. They certainly knew about it in 2005 when the water district met with the town to say, look, we just upgraded the fire protection system. We don't need the tank. We need a place for our antennas, and they had the discussion that kind of led to the insulation that we have today. Any other questions for... Attorney Anderson at this time? Just two. Um, either later this evening or later this week, could you submit uh, a copy of your presentation, the one that you had? On yes. The, so that it could be a part of the record. Yes, I will do that. Uh, and the second question is perhaps to Ben and then depending on what Ben okay. says, over to uh, Attorney Anderson. Um, let's assume that there's a, um, at the beginning, I had myself, but this is approved. Um, is there a setback requirement for any construction on this lot? Yes, there is. And so that there is a, a subsidiary issue of a, a variance to put any structure inside the setback. Is that right? Yes. If it, certainly, if they couldn't meet setback requirements, they would need a variance. Uh, Attorney Anderson has stated that they can meet all setback requirements, and I do concede that on their application, it is not clear that they meet the setbacks with their equipment shelter. But uh, Attorney Anderson has assured me that if this was approved, they do not need a variance to construct that. And if the zoning board heads down the path of approval, it should be done uh, with, a, with a condition that all setbacks are met. And, and if there would, because I just noticed that there's a new regulation to ordinance book, um, what page are we talking about when we're talking about a setback for the RA district? Oh, yeah. It's kind it, of hidden. Uh, it is the non-conforming, I, I think is the page you're on. So it would be not this chart here then? Yes. So it would be this chart in this column that we've probably on many applications prior we've talked about. Okay. Correct. Um, so we're looking at um, section 19.4.3. Um, page? Well, it looks like 35. page 35. Page 35 uh, in my book. You roughly, roughly page 35 for the, the non, the non, cause, because it's a non-conforming lot. Okay. So I guess what we can do is just put a marker down. Whatever the issue is on the invariance, we've raised it. Um, if there's dialogue, then that is what it is. I just want to make sure that when I was looked at the map, map that there, there may be an issue here for the uh, setback issue. But, okay. That's correct. Great. Thank you. Thanks. Okay. Thank you, Attorney Anderson. All right. Thanks, all. Attorney Hobbins, do you have anything to add? Thank you very much. Good evening, Mr. Chair and members of 
the council. My name is Barry Hobbins, and I'm here on behalf of AT&T Mobility, the authorized agent for new singular wireless PCS LLC, which does business here in the state of Maine as AT&T Mobility. Uh, first of all, let me say that I thought the presentation that was uh, just uh, made to you by Scott Anderson highlighted uh, the issues, especially dealing with the Spectrum Act and definitely with the historical aspects of the, the tower itself. I come about this a little differently. I have some history uh, in this community and uh, with uh, prior wireless telecommunications facilities. Uh, I was around uh, during the period of time, uh, in fact, before 2000, uh, when at the time doing permitting work for Vanguard Cellular Systems, that, which did business as Cellular One in Maine, um, I permitted the site at the Strout property, which at the time was the only uh, site in, the, in this community that had the possibility of having coverage, wireless telecommunications coverage for, at that time, Cellular One. Uh, at that time, there was uh, a move on because of the significant uh, uh, infusion of interest uh, to this community and every community in, in this country uh, to look at uh, alternatives to, uh, to the present scenario of essentially poor coverage as far as not even capacity but just coverage itself for wireless devices. And there was a movement on by the, this community to have different uh, citizen study groups and that were a part of the planning board process at that particular time. And that's what resulted in those um, discussions and the ordinance which was adopted, which took into consideration other possibilities such as alternative structures, the idea of co-locating uh, on either an existing structure uh, ironically, such as a water tank and other uses, and also uh, the idea of having some type of uh, possible overlay district so it would not be included in each and every district uh, within this area. Initially, the, uh, there were two possible alternatives that existed. One was the municipal landfill, your, your, your transfer station, and the second one, ironically, was the water tank in question on Avon Road. That was part of the discussion process during that time. And what occurred, and I commend, I commend the uh, neighbors of that area, uh, they were able to convince the council uh, not to look at that as a particular area for an overlay zone and not to allow for that type of use, um, that type of use for towers because there were proposed there was a proposal to put a tower behind the water tank uh, at, at one point by one of the carriers uh, in order to conceal the use the, the utilization of a, of a tower so what occurred about three years later is there was uh, again uh, many individual companies that were looking to expand the coverage for this community and one of the proposals which I was involved in uh, when, when I was involved with LCC International uh, for, at that time, uh, U.S. Cellular was to look to the Sprague property and uh, was involved with the discussions with the Sprague family for that particular site. And in fact, that site, uh, I believe, uh, went, on, went on the air in about 2004, 2005, late 2004, 2005. And so that was uh, essentially the third part of the overlay zone, the fourth, um, which, quite frankly, this community also discussed these issues with radio frequency engineers. And most of those radio frequency engineers at the time thought that you could have an overlay zone, but you're going to have to provide, if you want to provide coverage beyond uh, what was available with only two potential uh, areas of, of this community. The third one, obviously, was a big concession by many people, and that was the Sprague property. The, the other area, uh, which does provide good coverage, uh, with optimal coverage, which both Verizon, which is on a different, a different frequency and uses a different technology than, uh, than AT&T Mobility, uh, both concur that that is a site. If you utilize the idea of stealth application, as has been done in many communities, 
uh, I've I personally been involved in a, about 18 to 19 water tanks where uh, essentially either a shroud has been put on the water tank, such as the case uh, near the, the compound uh, in Cape Porpoise and near Kenny Bunkport where the president, where Walker's Point is, is involved. Uh, that was put on because of, of safety issues and because of telecommunications issues, quite frankly, because of the presence of a president of the United States and the commander in chief. It's one of the sites that was allowed, along with another site which I permitted. Also, in, in the Yarmouth, if you've noticed the shroud that's on the Yarmouth water tank, that was the first, uh, that was the first one uh, that was local that, um, quite frankly, has worked out extremely well. Interestingly enough, Yarmouth, uh, through the progressive, uh, progressiveness of their, uh, of their planner at the time, who used to be, member, be a member of the city council and a former legislator, uh, really tried to push the carriers to look at uh, the, the Cousins Island high stanchion uh, power mounts, the high intensity power mounts. And in 1996, uh, I represented at that time Vanguard Cellular, and we were the first one in New England to utilize that potential of having a power mount. Because what happens in a case like that, you had to, they only, they only lower the power once a year in order, and that we had to obviously coordinate it with the, with the community. But they would have rather had, and the community of, of Yarmouth would rather have some type of mount like that than something, something of, of, of a new tower. And so that's why we, first of all, all the carriers, if you talk to Bob Gashlin, who was here uh, for KJK Communications, who's a site acquisition specialist, he'll tell you that every carrier wants to utilize vertical real estate that is not go getting into a neighborhood battle of putting a new structure up that, in fact, is, could cause visual impact issues. And so there are many communities uh, that have looked to other alternatives. Um, many of you probably know the UCC church right in the middle of Cumberland, in Cumberland Center. I permitted, the, I permitted the first church structure, and that was an interesting creative one because the, uh, the um, tower itself, the, 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 the steeple itself, um, was dry rotting away. And uh, what AT&T did at the time uh, was essentially rebuilt the rebuilt with fiberglass and other uh, other consistent with the historical preservation commission and in other in others involved in the community and put a new a new steeple on that, that housed one carrier and in the basement of the there was a there was a soundproofed room where the equipment was held and the coax cable went down and you, you would never know there was anything in that tower. Since that time, I believe another carrier has uh, co-located um, in, in that particular tower also. I believe it's U.S. Cellular. So those, those are some of the ideas that we have. In this particular case, I, I feel kind of, I feel a little guilty because I know some of the, I know some of the uh, individuals who have real estate or live in that area, uh, and uh, it's, sometimes it's uncomfortable, especially when you're dealing with individuals that you know uh, and you still have a, a, a role and object, uh, you know, an objective to, to re reach as, as, as an attorney that I, that I do with these type of cases. If you look at the, um, the uh, response to the code enforcement decision dated May 2nd, uh, I took a different, a little different approach. First of all, um, AT&T Mobility did not send a, a what is known as a Section 6409 letter to the uh, local municipality. Um, and we, we submitted a building permit and used the building permit as the, as the means to get before the Zoning Board of Appeals. And one of the reasons we did that, even though, uh, it, it, even though we incorporated by reference uh, the Verizon Wireless's ZBA application uh, in supporting documents dated uh, April 16th. We also expanded uh, the arguments that were raised, uh, secondary arguments which were raised by uh, Verizon, and it basically talked about the zoning ordinance that you have in place now, uh, 
effectively prohibits AT&T from eliminating significant gaps of coverage that exist. And I think we've laid out in there, uh, which is supported by an affidavit and um, a coverage map, the before and after effect of what the coverage would look like, uh, which would address the significant gaps. And also, if you look, if you look, you will see an affidavit from our Ernesto Schuer, who the reason he's not here this evening uh, is that he is in my hometown of Saco on another particular site that uh, is being proposed uh, for co-location by AT&T. So if I, without repeating everything, I think that the position that uh, Mr. Anderson has taken uh, does, does significantly uh, make you want to at least sit, sit back and say, what should we do? And in our particular case, if, if in fact, hypothetically, if, if AT&T mobility, um, there is a, always that possibility that we might not be, we might not be able to reach the uh, threshold issues involved with the Spectrum Act. But ironically, under the Telecommunications Act of 1996, the, a community cannot discriminate one carrier versus the other carrier, which ironically would be, be a, a position that we would have, we would have a very strong position to effectively find another alternative location, either a structure, which I don't believe there is one, that would fill that gap, or a standalone wireless telecommunications uh, tower. And that's, uh, quite frankly, that's not a battle that, that, uh, that AT&T uh, looks to get involved in. But then again, we are, we are mandated under our licenses to provide coverage to communities. In particular, I, I know I got up there in, in this was 2000, 2000, and talked about how, and, I, and again, I haven't checked, but I believe from the standpoint of per capita use of wireless telecommunications devices, Cape Elizabeth was either, either second or first along with, with the town of Falmouth in that, in that regard. And I don't believe that's any different now. Uh, and as you probably all know, it's not just coverage we're talking about for, for a phone, that an analog phone. We're talking about devices that are smartphones that, that transfer a significant amount of data. So the process and the sophistication of these devices have been acknowledged, and that's why we have the Spectrum Act, Spectrum Act. and that's why we have uh, major, you know, the major carriers in the Spectrum being, being developed even further than it was before. We now have in the state of Maine more wireless t devices than we have landline phones. We have over 1.1 million devices in the state of Maine. And that, of course, back 14 years ago when this particular uh, community adopted their ordinance, uh, we were just looking at not smartphones, just phones to communicate with the, with the red button and a green button. Those days have, have come along, have come and gone. And no matter what occurs, I really do believe this community needs to take another look at developing an ordinance that brings you into this, the, the new millennium. Um, because I think it's, it's a responsibility of the federal government, and they've taken that responsibility to encourage and to essentially um, abrogate some of, the, some of the responsibilities of local communities to the federal government. In this particular case, I think that there is a significant gap of coverage. Um, I believe that your ordinance in your, your ordinance doesn't, with the overlay zone, doesn't provide uh, the effective coverage you need uh, and for your, for your residents of this community. So that's the approach I've taken. I respect very much the decisions you have to make as a, as a Zoning Board of Appeals and, and I, I ask you to consider all the alternatives. And also take a look at the, the decision, which I thought was a very good decision of your legal counsel, I believe it was January 9th of this year, acknowledging that, that there's a movement from the federal government to take over and, and usurp responsibilities 
uh, of local communities. Uh, and it might not be there yet. The Spectrum Act, as you know, the, the comment period has already passed, but who knows when the federal government and the FCC will act uh, with respect uh, to promulgating regulations that, quite frankly, might make this point moot. Thank you. I have a question before you go. Sure. Um, the affidavit of Ernesto Chua yes. Yes. Um, indicates that the proposed co-location would be at 73 feet 9 inches. Yes. Is that below this? And I didn't see no, any it's sims on the, for that. It's uh, my, please understand, we, we did not do any photo simulations. Um, our idea is to have these basically 12 antennas, uh, basically three, uh, three antennas per sector, and they would be on the shroud, um, which would in encompass, um, encompass the, um, the tower, the water tank. And I believe that's the, that's the area that, uh, that is not in conflict or interferes from a radio frequency standpoint with the proposed antennas that are being, uh, being uh, considered by Verizon. Would they be below the, Verizon, the proposed Verizon installation? From, from the drawings that I saw, I believe that there, there could be space on the same, at the same level. So at the same height. And are you using panels? Pardon me? Panels? Using small, mm -hmm. the small, small panels. By, we had a, the, I do have plans if anyone would like them we'll, and would be more than happy to submit them for, for the record and for consideration of, uh, of the plans that we have proposed pursuant to the application of the building permit. I believe you have, I think you have a copy of those plans, but if, I have nine extra copies if you, if you so desire, and I'll leave them with the secretary. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, we also received um, some correspondence from some, uh, I guess, attorneys uh, supporting residents opposing, um, including uh, Attorney Newsy and Attorney Armstrong. Um, are either of them here? I'd like to? Yes, uh, good afternoon. I'm, I'm Attorney Dan Nuzzi. Uh, Sorry, Nuzzi. Chairman Carver and Matt Desi from my office will provide some remarks and answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you very much. Good evening. My name is uh, Nat Bessie, and our firm, Brandon Isaacson, has been re retained by Brad Kaufman to provide some responses to the submissions by Verizon and AT&T. We've been here a little while. I'll keep it uh, as brief as I can. Um, I would like to just lay out a little bit our position on some of the issues that were raised in the presentation that you've just heard. Uh, specifically, I'd like to begin by, by saying that the, the real crux of the issue here is whether or not this permitted, uh, whether or not this proposed use is a permitted use in the, in the zone. Um, I believe that the question of federal preemption, the question of the Telecommunications Act, and whether there is a, whether this amounts to a denial of coverage, those really are, uh, in a sense, they, they are, they were described as secondary arguments, and I believe that's the correct way to, to characterize them. Those are issues that could be addressed in, if, if a rezoning process were pursued, that is the, in a way, that's the, the primary objection that I think that some of the Mr. Kaufman has at the moment is that this is too significant and too serious a proposal to move forward with just a simple building permit application. Um, so I'd like to begin by just addressing a few of the, the individual arguments. Uh, our first argument is the question of whether or not the water tank is an alternative tower structure. Uh, Mr. Chairman, you, you pointed out the the definition says that an alternative tower structure must be used for a primary purpose other than to support an antenna. I understand Attorney uh, Anderson's argument that it ought to be read to say a purpose other than the antenna being proposed. 
Uh, you know, frankly, the ordinance does not say that, and we don't believe that's the correct reading. At this point, the water tank does not have a use as for water storage. It only has a use for supporting an antenna. As a result, we don't believe that it is an alternative tower structure. In response to the question, well, what about a clock tower that no longer runs? What about a bell tower that no longer tolls? I mean, a bell tower could be a part of a church. It, 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 I think that the, a tank without water is, is truly a, a tank without a use in a different and more significant way than some of these hypotheticals. Um, and then moving on, the other issue about the, the use, you mentioned is it an accessory use, is it a primary use? Uh, the definition of accessory use also provides that the accessory use shall not become greater in the aggregate than the primary use. So we dispute the, the idea that, that a, the location of the water district's antenna is itself a permitted primary use. I understand that, that position, but I, that's not the position that we take. But even so, a proposal for not one, and there are two at the moment, uh, cellular facilities, and the leases anticipate as many as four that use is not accessory. It becomes a primary use, and that's not permitted under the ordinance. Uh, on the question of federal preemption, the Spectrum Act, I'd just like to point out, is, is from the year 2012, there have been no federal courts that have yet overruled a zoning decision on the basis of the Spectrum Act. It's simply a very new statute, and to take the position here for the Zoning Board of Appeals to say that, that your own authority is somehow supplanted by the Spectrum Act would be, it would be a novel interpretation. It would be a new understanding of that act. Uh, the definition of base station is the crux of the issue that really, uh, under the Spectrum Act. That is truly the, it's both the most significant and least clear element of this very small statute. Uh, and we think that the, the legislative history of the Spectrum Act indicates that we're really talking about facilities that are already housing cellular equipment. So that if there were a structure in this zone that already had a large cellular facility, say Verizon had one, I think that it would be a much stronger argument that the Spectrum Act would need to allow AT&T to put one on there. That's not the situation that we're, we're talking about right now. Uh, finally, the question about what is a significant change the guidance document the I'm sorry to interrupt you. Can you elaborate on that point a little bit and go back to what you just said? Were you saying that the Spectrum Act, if there was one facility on the water tank, then the Spectrum Act would provide for the addition of as many other facilities as possible? Well, so I, I think that, that if there were an actual wireless facility on a water tower, that wireless facility could very well be a base station under the Spectrum Act. But that base station, as it is intended in that, in that statute, does not include what we have in the case of the, of the water tank. Does that answer your question? Or? I'm sorry. I thought that what you were saying was that to the extent there is one facility located on the water tower that the Spectrum Act would then make it easier for additional facilities to be added. I, I believe that's correct, and I think that's something that the, that the board should be aware of, is to what extent does a decision now open the door to additional facilities with less a lower standard of review? The Spectrum Act is still, it has not really been tested in litigation in the courts, but certainly the argument under the Spectrum Act is much stronger if Verizon is already there, if AT&T is already there. When the third person wants to come in, when the fourth person wants to come in, I think that you know, that's when federal law starts coming into play in a more significant way than it is right now. Um, also under the Spectrum Act, the question is, uh, does the proposed facility substantially change the existing tower or base station? Now, we propose that the water tower is not an existing base station, but even if it were, the question of what is a substantial change, the four factors that were up in the presentation 
are taken from a section of an agreement that applies specifically to towers themselves. And I, I think that it, it is really an apples and oranges comparison. And so that, that guidance we also think ought to be taken with a, with a grain of salt and not, not seen as the be all and end all, the question of whether, uh, whether a, the addition of a facilities and equipment shed is a significant change or the addition of two equipment sheds in the case of two applicants or of three equipment sheds if there's a third applicant. Um, I, I don't think that it's a correct or a reasonable interpretation to say that, of course, a, a, an equipment shed cannot be a significant change. When you're talking about a small parcel, if you're talking about a facility that does not already house wireless equipment, the addition of this shed could be quite significant. And that's certainly something that can and should be uh, considered by the, the code enforcement officer and by the board. And then finally, I just want to briefly address the question of uh, the Telecommunications Act and whether the zoning ordinance is a prohibition of service. Uh, our, our position there is, is simply, this is not there. In order to overrule a zoning decision that's based on substantial evidence under the Telecommunications Act, on the basis that that, argue, that denial was resulted in the prohibition of service, a carrier needs to show that there were no alternative options. They pursued alternative options. Uh, that hasn't been done here. Frankly, these are issues, again, that are well suited to the you know, rezoning process if that's something that's appropriate. It's not the type of thing that should be taken into account and, and sort of addressed definitively at this stage. And so the, the real takeaway from our perspective is that this permit application doesn't meet the standards for being an accessory use on an alternative tower structure. And as a result, the proper way, if, if there is a need for additional wireless service in this area, if it can only be addressed by building a facility on a particular place, the proper way to pursue that, given that it is not a permitted use, is to pursue a rezoning process. And that this, we don't see any particular reason for a, uh, an expedited or lower standard of review. And I'm happy to answer any questions anyone has. Any questions from the board? Thank you, Attorney Vesey. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> My name is Anthony Armstrong. I am uh, here tonight representing uh, Priscilla Armstrong, who owns approximately 10.75 acres of real estate that abuts on two sides of the subject property in question here tonight. And also, there's a, her right of way and driveway goes on the third side of it. It's very close to the current tower if you visited the site. Um, I'm trying to keep things relevant here to the the legal issues at hand, both locally and with the Spectrum Act. But I did note that some of the proponents here tonight uh, did take a little license and drift off a little bit. So I thought I might just make a couple of quick comments about the, about the history of things. And at a couple points along the way in the argument, there's been a discussion of the use of the tower and the intent of the water district and what their plans are and that sort of thing. And what's Intriguing to me, although I do not have uh, the research behind this to, to support this contention, but I, I think we've heard enough at the October meeting with the water district present where the operations manager of the water district said to the assembled group that there were plans to take down the water tower. In fact, he said that one of the reasons they didn't go ahead was that the price of metal changed. It went down and it... Uh, they felt it was not maybe the right time to do it. So that tells me that beyond this discussion of the, of the critical usefulness of the stick antenna for the, for the SCADA system, uh, somebody must have, a, have had in mind an alternative. And uh, could be wrong, but I think there's some, probably some emails out there. And I, I would just ask the Water District to defend itself on that position. He, clearly, many of us were there that night. 
they said they, they, they were contemplating and planned on taking down the tower, and everybody in the neighborhood thought they were too. And it's also hard to believe, as Mr. Anderson asserts in his uh, memorandum to you, that uh, I won't quote it, but basically this, this location for this SCADA system at this location is critical for the operations of the sewer system in the town. I can't believe with all the technology that Mr. Hobbins and has talked about tonight, and we all know about this, not some alternative means by which these pump stations and the sewer treatment plant can be communicated with. And I, I just have not seen that argument fully fleshed out. What I do think is very obvious is that the water district, when you look at the timings of emails and memos and that sort of thing, took a new interest in this activity and possibility when someone came to them and said, we can give you $30,000 per year for each uh, unit lo salt system located at the site, and we'll pay to paint the tower and repaint the tower, which apparently hasn't been painted for 20 years, as you can see from the picture. So all of a sudden, the water district took a new interest in this thing. And to some extent, this is irrelevant, but uh, to me, it's, it's important if we're going to talk about the history of things here. And also, one of the things I've put in my brief that's not in the other briefs, and others have looked at this, I really can't see in the water district's charter anywhere where there's a specification that says that they can be into the communication systems game uh, in terms of providing sites for cell phone towers and on the thin argument that they're going to take the income from that and put it into the sewer system of the town of Cape Elizabeth. Uh, I just don't see that in their 18-page charter, which is part of the statute of the state of Maine. Um, Having said all that, I, I, I simply want to summarize things and shorten things up a little bit by saying that I've reviewed everybody's briefs, Verizon, AT&T, and the Brandon Isaacson brief. And I, I must say, I obviously have reviewed uh, the CEO's, the code enforcement officer's uh, letter of denial, both letters. And I just, you just have to conclude that the CEO's letter of denial is on sound legal grounds. And I have to say that the Brand and Isaacson brief is excellent and well-founded, and not to take away from the positions taken by the proponents of the cell tower, but I just think that all taken in whole, that the opponents and the denial here uh, by the CEO sh uh, should be supported. Uh, one of the things I'd like to just ask by way of a question, if I could, uh, I haven't heard much discussion of the fact that the, the term, uh, the definition of the word antenna and the use of the word antenna in the ordinance at 1961B4, uh, where it says, in terms of accessory uses in a residential A zone, commercial wireless telecommunication, telecommunication service antenna, uh, that's singular, but it's, that's how it's written, antenna which is attached to an alternative tower structure in a manner which conceals the presence of an antenna. So that's kind of where we're all focused here, correct? So then you go back to the definition of antenna in the ordinance uh, on page three, and it's kind of long, but it basically says, any structure or device used for the purpose of collecting or radiating electromagnetic magnetic waves, including but not limited to directional antennas, such as panels, microwave dishes, and satellite dishes, and omnidirectional antennas, such as whip antennas, which are located on the exterior of or outside of any building or structure. A single radiating antenna platform, which includes one or more antennas, shall be regulated as a single antenna. I, I could be off on the wrong track here, and that's why I'm putting this as a question. But I think we're talking about antennas here. I don't think we're talking about agglomerations of, of, of equipment uh, that are the kind that are proposed for the base of this tower. And I'm not sure what the intent of the council, the planning board, and recommending to the council this language was, but it seems to me the intent is to keep these agglomerations of equipment at the base of these towers very confined. And I, with all due respect to Mr. Hobbins, he did a great job out there in Cumberland. He got the equipment into the basement. Maybe the solution here is to put the equipment into the tank. But the point is, no one has really addressed the fact it's the equipment on the ground that is the biggest, the, really the biggest problem. And I haven't heard anybody address this, this question of antenna. So if I got that right, uh, Mr. McDougall, through the chair, that we're talking about antenna here?
It's a question. Uh, no, I, I understand. I, you, I mean, I, I well, we, no one's, we no one's, take that up as a board. Uh, fine. I mean, I, I, okay, okay, I understand. Um, and, and, I, and I say it could be an anomaly, but I really think the intent here was not to have, you know, someone decide that the Spurwing Church is a great place for one of these antennas. Maybe they don't need to be so high when new technology comes along. But where do you put the equipment? You know, Mr. Hobbins found a place in the basement in Cumberland, apparently, but I'm not sure you find it elsewhere. So what we're left with here on Avon Road is the probability of four agglomerations of equipment. And it isn't just the one house. It's the power board, it's the uh, transformer board, the electrical board. There's other forms of equipment on these campuses that'll really do the damage to this neighborhood. So that's, that's a, a point that I, that I wanted to make. Um, and in terms of the uh, subservience of the accessory use to the primary use, I mean, it, it, it's pretty clear what happens here. When you start to look at what the completed product here is, it becomes very obvious that the, the accessory use becomes, becomes the primary use. Uh, and that same argument blends into the significant change uh, language in the Spectrum Act. Um, it, it, is, it is an open question, in spite of the fact that Mr. Anderson seems to have a time warp mentality, and I give him credit for that because he's very articulate, but he's constantly, from the October meeting on, referred to these FCC uh, uh, guidances, which are not yet in proposed rules, as in fact law. They just are not in fact law, and I think when the FCC really sits down and looks at what can happen, and this is one of the greater examples of what can happen if they let these rules run rampant, that, that this is one example where there's a significant change, particularly on the ground, which should not, should not be allowed in an unplanned way. The notion that four of these things can r arrive seriatim with no relationship to each other is just a, a it puts planning and zoning and all, all that is meant to be, uh, you know, into the backwaters, if not into, into the last century. And uh, lastly, I, I'd like to say that the, Mr. Hobbins' emphasis on the Telecommunications Act of 1996 is, is well taken, but all that really says to our side of the argument is, you know, why haven't these cell phone companies, first of all, tried to do something at the tr transfer station site? There's been no discussion of what they've tried to do with the Sprags or the Strouts if they're not already there. And most importantly, if they can't make those three sites work, why then have they not come to the planning board to work out a proposed zone change that would be recommended to the council? Uh, and along those lines, I note that nothing in the comprehensive plan of the town of Cape Elizabeth talks about the possibility of putting these cell phone towers in this particular neighborhood. But my major point here is, here they come with a quick fix. Here they come with a building permit application after meeting with the neighborhood and telling us that there'd be plenty of other meetings, and then there weren't any meetings, there was just an application. Here they come with the quick fix, when they haven't done the, the homework and the hard work of coming to the planning board and the town council and, and saying, what else can we do? We have a problem in the town of Cape Elizabeth. And the last point I'd like to make is, I'm not so sure we have that big a problem. I think most people are aware that you can buy, for $225 or $250, you can buy a box from Time Warner, a one-time expense, there's no monthly charge. You plug it into your computer, and this box becomes your in-home cell phone antenna, and it works very, very effectively. So it may be that we all don't all live in the, you know, in a perfect cell phone reception zone, but uh, there are ways, there are ways to address, to ways to address that. Any questions? Thank you very much. Thank you, Armstrong. Before we move to general comment, is there any representative from the water district here? No? Okay. Um, I guess I'd like to open it up to public comment. Anybody else who's here who would like to speak? Good evening. My name is Brad Kaufman, and I live at 1 Avon Road. In, in denying the building permit applications, the code enforcement officer concluded that each of the proposals considered separately 
substantially changes the physical dimensions of the existing facility. And I think that conclusion has relevance both to the question of the ordinance and to the question of federal preemption. And I'd like just to talk about the federal preemption issue for a second because I've learned more about that issue than I ever hoped to in the course of the last few months. Attorney Anderson showed you four standards that define substantial change, and he referred to the co-location agreement as the source for those, for those standards. And that co-location agreement is currently used to determine when a property or a structure would be subject to historical impact review. In that co-location agreement, those four standards that were put up on the screen are standards of change that pertain only to towers, which are, which are structures that were built for the purpose of housing antennas. In the programmatic agreement, in the co-location agreement, they explicitly do not apply to alternative tower structures. And if we have anything here, it would be an alternative tower structure. And so while it might make sense if we're talking about a tower which was built on a property that can accommodate a tower, it might make sense that an equipment shed would be reasonable presumptively. But if we're talking about a very different kind of structure in a residential neighborhood, the same conclusion is not obvious. Now if I'm wrong about the limitation of those four standards to structures that were built for the purpose of housing antennas, I, I, would, I would appreciate being corrected, but actually I don't think I'm, I don't think I'm wrong about that. And so I think, I think that it was perfectly reasonable for the code enforcement officer to conclude that this is in fact substantial change. I think the same sort of reasoning pertains relative to the local ordinance. The ordinance says that you have to conceal the presence of the antenna. There are other ordinances that in, in other towns that use more permissive language. They talk about concealment. They talk about camouflage. Our ordinance talks about concealing the presence. The water tower is 30 feet wide, 30 feet wide. And Attorney Anderson talked about antennas protruding not more than 10 feet or less than 10 feet, I think he said. But if it's about 10 feet in either direction, you're increasing the width of the towers of, of the water tower by two thirds. And how is it possible to conceal the presence of an antenna that effectively increases the width of the structure by up to two thirds? I suggest that it's not. And so, sub again, substantial change and it's important relative to the analysis of, of the ordinance. Finally, relative to the ordinance, what I would suggest is, as has been pointed out a number of times, that, that the accessory use, the principal use, cannot become subordinate to the accessory use. And when you think about the magnitude of the change with the two facilities, if in fact the SCADA antennas are the principal use, then of course they become subordinate to all of the change that would be implemented because of the two proposals. So I think, I think Mr. McDougal was absolutely correct to conclude that this is substantial change and that matters both relative to the federal issue and to the ordinance issue. And he was talking about each of the proposals considered separately. Of course, we as neighbors must evaluate the aggregated impact of the two proposals. And we must be wary of the fact that Verizon's lease with the water district contemplates up to four facilities on this property. And I think you're absolutely right, by the way, that once one of these facilities goes in, then others coming along and, and claiming that they are protected by the Spectrum Act, I think that, that argument becomes much more difficult to, to disagree with. So, so we have to consider the potential for up to four facilities. And in the aggregate, these changes go well beyond substantial. In, in the context of a small parcel in an RA zone, they're, they're transformative. And, and I would submit to you that transformative change requires a more extensive review and approval process than building permits allow.
If the carriers wish to pursue their proposals, they should do so by initiating a rezoning process. That's the conclusion supported by the CEO's decision and by my attorney's analysis. And by the way, that's exactly what Verizon assured us at the neighborhood meeting in October that it would do. So I would ask you to consider the code enforcement officer's decision about substantial change. And if these proposals are to proceed, then they should proceed through the route of rezoning. Thanks very much. Thank you, Mr. Kaufman. I'm Priscilla Armstrong, and I live at 18 Avon Road, and my property abuts the water district property on two sides, and I have a right-of-way across the third side. Um, and as a point of interest, the town rezoned my particular piece of property to residential B zone for continued residential use and development, sort of unbeknownst to me, but I didn't really object to it. And I don't really find that very compatible to um, increase commercial use of the Portland Water District. So I think the town has got two messages there. I urge you to support um, Ben McDougall's uh, denial of the building permit as requested by Verizon and AT&T. I have, of course, concerns about decreased property values increased noise from the equipment that will be on the ground, which will be very close to the other abutting neighbor, um, the Darlings. Uh, increased traffic on a very narrow, dead-end street, and the significant visual impact that the proposed facilities will have, not only to the people who live on our street, but to the neighborhood as a whole. But I am most deeply concerned about the manner that this has played out, the fact that the Verizon did assure us at the October 2nd meeting that there would be continued opportunity for public meetings and comments, the fact that the Water District had a consultant that reported back to the trustees, that there was no concern particularly issued at this meeting, and that was when they went into the lease agreement with Verizon. I would point out that the neighbors actually on Avon Road have been rather good neighbors to the Portland Water District. That tower has not been painted since 1984. It is a rusting hulk, leaching who knows what into the ground. It is the local hangout for probably every kid in Cape Elizabeth from the age of 12 on up. We spend a lot of time cleaning up trash. And we've never really complained to the Water District because we felt that the Water District facility provided security to all of the town of Cape Elizabeth. So we've been good neighbors. We feel that we're being treated rather badly. Please consider this appeal and the denial of this appeal very seriously. Our town code enforcement officer clearly addressed the concerns around the use of the water tower as a potential facility for cell towers and that it does not meet the requirements for this use. I really urge you to uphold this decision and thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Armstrong. Any other public comment? Thank you. Uh, my name is Pavel Darling. I live at 9 Avon Road with my wife and daughter, and we are the closest house to the water tower. Um, you've heard a lot of arguments uh, from both sides today, and there's been a lot of information and a lot of talk about a variety of things. If you boil it all down, it comes down to the fact that this is a residential neighborhood. You've heard from my uh, neighbors. You've heard from other members of the community. You've seen lots of emails and conversations. Um, if you put it all aside, what is determined by uh, the code enforcement officer is that in the residential zone, this is not a permitted use. And this is a, it's truly a residential zone. There is no other commercial activity around there. It's a non-conforming water tower. And so when attorneys Anderson and the representative from AT&T discuss all of these other facets, they're talking about a situation that is not the situation that we have here in Cape Elizabeth. It's a very small residential area 
And so building a wireless telecommunication facility with a whole bunch of equipment shelters is, as was pointed out by Brad Kaufman, a very substantial and transformative change. When Verizon and AT&T have come up with their information and their applications, the information that they've provided us as community members has been uh, oftentimes confusing, sometimes misleading, and, and just kind of, as Priscilla mentioned, aggravating because we just felt we weren't part of the process. And that was something that had been promised to us. And what I think is important for you, the zoning board, to understand is the charge to you is really to think about this building application and not to think about all of the other issues that have been kind of discussed here tonight. That is part of the town zoning process. And that's something that's really kind of in a different venue. And so I'd encourage you to think very kind of clearly about this particular building application, the lack of information that we, the community, have received about exactly what's going on and exactly how transformative this will be to this particular plot of land. As the code enforcement officer and other attorneys have all determined, this is not a permitted use. The application has been denied. I would encourage you to affirm that decision, to deny the appeal, and to really kind of give us the peace of mind that if Verizon and AT&T really do want to proceed with this, that they'll do it in the appropriate venue, which is part of the town's rezoning process. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, my name is Bob Cronin. I live at 7 Avon Road. I've been there for 32 years. I've had to stare at this monstrosity every morning when I want to pick up my mail and paper. Uh, I just have four quick points, maybe five. Uh, I fought this battle twice before, and it was before the, the town council and before the uh, uh, planning board. I suggest that those are the correct venues to address this issue. Uh, where the elected representatives of the, of the people of Cape Elizabeth have the final say and not a judicial board. Uh, four br brief points here. Under duties and powers of the zoning board, it says, under administrative appeals 1952A, uh, to determine whether the decision of the code enforcement officer is in conformity with the provisions of this ordinance and to modify such decision to conform with such provisions and to interpret the meaning of the ordinances in all cases of uncertainty. You are not empowered or have the uh, obligation to interpret federal law. So I ask you to ignore the provisions of the Spectrum Act as it's been interpreted here. It's not within your purview. I'd like to quote about the, this is a residence A, the purpose of a residence A according to 1961. The residence A district includes lands that are outside of the built-up areas of Cape Elizabeth, lands for which public sewer lines are not expected to be extended in the near future, and large tracts suitable for farming, woodland production, and wildlife habitat. The purpose of this district is to allow residential development that is compatible with the character, scenic value, and traditional use of rural uh, lands, and does not impose an undue burden on the provision of municipal services. Doesn't say anything about private enterprise, uh, commercial enterprises being allowed to produce there. If the uh, installation of uh, transmission to, uh, facilities is permitted, uh, it will require accessory buildings down below. Now, it seems to me that do you consider the accessory buildings part of the tower, or are they separate buildings, and is that a permitted use uh, uh, on this property? Uh, under reconstruction or replacement provision, uh, I'm sorry, I don't have the... Uh, Page 38 it says, any non-conforming structure which is located closer than required setbacks of the property line, which is 125 feet, 125% uh, of the height of the tower, which this would not qualify for, it says, uh, property line is removed, damaged, or destroyed, may be reconstructed or replaced with that a per provided that a permit is obtained within one year. Uh, let me skip to the last sentence here. In no case shall a structure reconstructed or replaced uh, uh, so as to increase its nonconformity. So if, you're go if building accessory buildings for four cell, uh, cellular phone services providers uh, is per was permitted, then you would be increasing the nonconformity of the lot. And lastly, 
uh, and changes in nonconforming use. A lawful nonconforming use shall not be changed to any other than a permitted use in the district in which it is located or to a less objectionable, less detrimental nonconforming use as determined by the Zoning Board of Appeals according to the following standards. A, the proposed use shall not increase the hours of operation. B, the proposed use shall not create hazardous and increased traffic conditions, which if you install four uh, companies have their uh, transmission facilities at this thing, will de definitely increase traffic in a, in a one-lane road. Uh, at a, a dead end one lane road in a, in a residential district. Uh, at the, uh, and the number D, the proposed use of, will not adversely affect the value of adjacent properties. Well, I always had hopes that this tower would someday be torn down. Uh, and it seems to me, but allowing transmission facilities on it s sort of rewards the, the, uh, the water district for uh, changing the use of the water tower into the base uh, for a transmission facilities, and then they get to get charge rent to uh, commercial enterprises for the use of their tower as a, a transmission facility. That impresses me as somewhat sleazy, and I don't think it should be allowed. Thank you. Any questions? Thank you. Any further public comment? Um, Attorney Anderson, would you like any rebuttal or any further comments? Yeah, let me just, a, a couple of kind of common things that came up first. In addition to giving you all a copy of the PowerPoint, I'll give you a copy of the lease that we have with the Portland Water District. I don't think I gave that to Ben as part of the building permit uh, package, but I appreciate that um, there are kind of two uh, targets of concern that have come up. One, frustration with the water district and whether they have the legal right to do that. We don't think there's any question they do and we have a lease um, and we think that's kind of the end of the issue uh, with respect to disputes over whether they have the authority to enter into this arrangement. Um, and we'll provide you a copy of that lease so it's in the record. <clears throat> the second thing is, and this really goes to the issue of why we have the Spectrum Act, why you have co-location provisions. Um, it is almost always the case that when you have a structure that is up, that has antennas on it that are currently being used, that there are people that do not like the structure. They're not terribly concerned with the addition of another carrier's antennas. They may not object to the equipment shelter, but they don't want the structure there. And so a lot of these provisions in the Spectrum Act in particular recognizes that in zoning and site plan review and all of those more formal proceedings that, that people were able to stop the expansion of a broadband network because of disputes about these underlying structures. And the purpose of the alternative tower structure provision, the purpose of the Spectrum Act, is to recognize that when a structure has been here for 70 years, which is longer than anybody else in this neighborhood that's been there, that it is an existing structure that is tall enough and in a location that it is providing a base station capability for an FCC license, that this is the kind of site where you want to direct carriers to go. Um, and that if there is objection to the tank or a tower or whatever else existing structure is there, that is seen as a problem. And, and the Spectrum Act is really trying to get at that. So we appreciate that there are a lot, uh, maybe not a lot of people, but there are some people that would like the tank to, to have never been there or the tank to go away. Um, but the tank is there. And the question really for the Zoning Board of Appeals is, given these different provisions, given that we're able to use an existing structure, um, is that what your ordinance is, is focusing on? So um, we appreciate there's objections to structures all the time, but this is actually the problem that the Spectrum Act was um, enacted to um, address. Um, can, can, and, I, can I just jump in? Sure, go right ahead. Question. Um, following up from the public comment, and I had the same thought, how do we have power to apply this federal law when the ordinance seems very specific that all we are empowered to do is to determine whether a decision of the code enforcement officer is in conformity with provisions of the ordinance and to modify such decisions to conform with such provisions and to interpret the meaning of the ordinance in all cases of uncertainty. Yeah. So I, I don't see anything in the ordinance that gives Let's us the power this. to apply federal law and to deal with this preemption. 
it, to me, it seems like that that's for somebody, somebody else, else to do, not this board. Well, I, I appreciate that. I think that the the though the interpretation of your authority is is too narrow. I mean, you've got you have preemption on cell phone towers that applies to this issue we've talked about tonight. There has, for you know, a decade or more, been uh, prohibitions on municipalities regulating siting based on the perceived health effects of you know emissions coming from these towers. That's an issue that municipalities have had to dealt with and have, you know, have flipped planning board decisions on the basis of that express preemption. Um, natural gas pipelines, there's other kinds of construction that, that come before municipal boards that are unquestionably um, have a preemptive um, uh, role and maybe John could talk to the, the board a little bit more about when it's appropriate but um, but you're, you're, you're in a position of having to evaluate whether or not Ben's decision is right and in doing that you've got to look at all of the legal issues that pertain to Ben's decision and and in this case one of those is the federal preemption from the Spectrum Act so I believe it's within your charge and authority to do it and in fact it's I think it's part of your responsibility in making the determination I appreciate that it may not be an issue you deal with all the time which is why this is a little more complicated maybe and again maybe John can speak to the scope of that um, um, but I think it's kind of within your bailiwick the only other comment that, that I wanted to address is this accessory versus primary use and notwithstanding how important we think cell phone coverage is, um, the Portland Water District, not speculating, not you know guessing what the future might be, but has made it clear to the town that those antennas are being used as part of the sewer treatment system for the town of Cape Elizabeth and that no other location was available for that. So even though we think that cell phone coverage is very important, the issue of what is the accessory and what is the primary use is not tied to the size of the antennas that go on this tank. The primary use, and it's more important, I will admit, than cell phone coverage, is that your toilets and your septic systems work in Cape Elizabeth. That is the primary use of this tank. It will continue to be the primary use of this tank, whether we go on or whether AT&T Verizon have to go find other alternatives. So um, we're not supplanting the, the primary use at all. So. Um, I think most of the other issues I probably kind of hit on early on. Yes, Joanna. Could you speak to the um, the role of the equipment shed first? Is your proposed equipment shed does it accommodate more than one user? Does it accommodate all four? Well, yeah, kind of two points. One, uh, uh, well, right now the equipment shelter as shown on our plan is sufficiently sized for Verizon Wireless's facility. Um, originally in a plan that we had kind of showed to Ben, we had contemplated a slightly longer facility that would hold both AT&T and Verizon. That, of course, if you got to the concealment discussion with Ben and the planning board, there might be a discussion about whether it made more sense to make one larger one with both carriers. That is certainly an option. Um, also, uh, you know, the, the lease language about multiple additional carriers is standard boilerplate stuff. This is not a very tall tank. Um, I, you know, AT&T is going on the same level that we're going at. Um, I think, uh, I suppose it's conceivable that more carriers could go on. Um, uh, I think it's unlikely. But more important, if there are two other carriers that want to come on, you want them to go on this tank. Now, if you don't want the tank there, I understand why you don't want the tank there and you want the tank to go away. But if we accept the fact that the tank is staying and that it's providing a primary service for the utility company, then you don't want other carriers going around and trying to build other structures or dragging you into court because they can't make those other structures work. So in the one hand, I feel like multiple carriers on this one side is characterized as a bad thing. It's actually a good thing for the town because you won't need to build any additional structures to provide adequate coverage by multiple multiple carriers. And you know, this is a very good site. This tank has been there for 70 years and the trees around this tank have not been cut in 70 years. It is densely developed with trees. It's very, very difficult to see this, in particular when the leaves are on. Um, and it, it's even conceivable we could work with the I'm planning board in different the location. colors. What, I guess yes. the question that I was trying to get an answer to is what concealment will be afforded with regard to the equipment shed? Is it your position that the equipment shed is an entirely separate structure that is not within the definition of alternative tower structure? Is it within that definition? If it is within that definition, how is it concealed? If it's not within that definition, 
where is it permitted? Okay. Yeah, the, the equipment shelter is an essential part of the, the wireless facility, and it is part of the definition of the alternative tower structure. So, um, I mean, you don't have any sites in the United States with an antenna connected with an electric line to the telephone pole. The antennas send and receive signals that are generated by the equipment in the equipment shelter. So every single facility, every wireless facility that would go on any alternative tower structure will have both the antennas, but there will be equipment here, it's an external um, equipment shelter, which is 90% of cell phone sites in Maine, and the electronic equipment is housed inside the building. So the, um, the, um, like the shielding of the building is, we've proposed to do it as a, as a clabbered, peaked roof shed, even though those components of the design are not necessary for the shelter to function and, and, and hold the equipment that's critical for the operation of the facility. But I guess what I'm trying to get at is that if you're saying, what I'm hearing you say is that the equipment shed does need to be included within the definition of alternative tower structure, but then does it not need to be concealed well, it, entirely? Uh, well, not necessarily. I mean, I think this question of concealment is, um, it, it is not, there's language in some ordinances that say that for a facility that is contained wholly within an existing building or structure, X, Y, and Z. So this is an issue of concealment. So it's a water tank. You can't put um, you know, electric wiring on the inside of a sealed water tank. Um, you know, we, we're, um, well, because of moisture issues and um, structural issues of cutting through the side of the tank um, is, is not feasible for the site. Um, so what we've it's done not to try feasible from an engineering perspective or a cost perspective. Well, certainly not a cost perspective, um, um, and and uh, you know so I I think it's I suppose it's conceivable that if you got to that phase of looking at this on the concealment provision, um, I don't know if it's technically feasible to put it inside. Um, that could be something that we could look at with the planning board to evaluate whether that was a possibility. I don't think it happens in uh, many sites, but, um, but that is possible that it could be something that was considered. The, the equipment shelter and the equipment therein is a central part of the facility, um, and, and notwithstanding the reading of the antenna language, um, it, it has, it's, it's, it's part of the, the facility and, and would need to be all included in an insulation on an alternative tower structure. Um, Are you contemplating that you would get a building permit and then need to go to the planning board? I've heard you reference the planning board no. times and what they may or may not require, and I just am trying to get a Understand. sense of what your sense of the process is. Yeah, the provision for alternative tower structures is a building permit that's issued by Ben, but there's a provision in the ordinance that if Ben is concerned that the concealment is, he's not comfortable with the concealment or doesn't feel that he's uh, confident that he can make a determination about whether the concealment is adequate, he can refer the question to the planning board on that one issue of concealment to get input and feedback from them. Um, and, and, and what kind of Ben has said is, look, I, I found that the tank wasn't an alternative tower structure, so I didn't even really get to the concealment part, but that could conceivably follow if the board were to send it back uh, with instructions to kind of sort out the concealment issue. Thanks. And if you don't have any other questions, I will sit down and let you talk amongst yourselves. Thank you. Thanks, all. Attorney Hovins, do you have any? Just a brief comment regarding uh, concealment, which I think is a very good question to ask. Um, one of the ways that I've seen to use, utilize uh, concealment, in fact, in this particular case, AT&T uh, is going to, first of all, make their structure with seated shake siding, and in, it, this is not the, the norm of a prefabbed you know, cabinet or prefab building. The other issue is you use, um, use screening of shrubberies and the like, stockade fencing instead of the, uh, instead of, uh, you know, barbed wire fencing around it. Uh, you can make, you, you, depending on the situation in the neighborhood, you can also, in many times, you can use eight foot arborvitae um, uh, plantings and you can, you can separate the neighbors, the, the neighbor's uh, uh, boundary with such things as that. You put together a 
a plan that the planning board at the instruction in this particular case at the instruction of the code enforcement officer to send those issues to the planning board uh, we you know the planning board would make those decisions whether or not different aspects could be looked at the other aspect it could be looked at which I'm not saying this but this is an older version of a water tank I don't know whether the structural integrity would be threatened uh, by inserting the equipment somehow inside the water tank. Um, I know it's been done before, uh, but it all depends on the, the integrity of the tank and, and obviously the, the idea of uh, the, the issue of water damage and the like. You have to have a, a, an ideal location. Uh, I, I personally have driven by it, but I've never, I don't know what the structural integrity is. But those are issues that, that you can get beyond uh, if we were given the opportunity, but obviously this is a, the building permit um, decisions before you and that's an initial determination before we can go to the next step. But I think you would have the, the two carriers involved would work with the, would work with the neighborhood. Obviously, uh, if you could visually, if you can visually minimize the impact uh, by, by taking mitigating steps, um, that's something you could, to consider. Thank you. Any other further public comment? Okay, this will close the public comment and uh, open the board discussion. Uh, they want to start. Good question. Maybe Ben, you can clarify a few things for me. What do you see the primary use of the old water tower as? I mean, obviously, it, the primary use was as a water tower. Today, it houses the SCADA equipment for the Portland Water District. Well, by by default, that there. Yeah, I mean, there has there has to be a primary use of the property. Uh, there, there's no documentation that a permit was obtained for that equipment, which makes it a gray area whether whether that is a uh, legally non-conforming use or actually it could be argued that it's a conforming use based on the uh, resource protection zoning. Uh, but I, I did request uh, from the water district more documentation on how that antenna came to be to try to flesh that out a little more I didn't receive a response so I didn't get much further there would be nothing to stop them though from filling that tank up with water tomorrow if they wanted to right correct no, nothing nothing that I'm aware of Are you saying that because the primary use could change or? I'm saying that to the extent there is an existing tank on there that is owned by the Portland Water District that hasn't been decommissioned, that is still, that stopped being used in 2007 for a conforming use, that there's nothing to prohibit from being reused for that same purpose, that much like an unoccupied residential home, it's still, being used for that purpose. There's a water tank on it. It's still a utility essential services use. You're saying that they haven't lost the right to make it a water tower again. It, it, it is what it is. It's physically a water tower. It just doesn't happen to have water in it. That doesn't make it not a, it's still owned by the Portland Water District. Yes. I mean, how is that not still? On you know, the town's tax records. Sorry, Josh, go ahead. How is that not being used as a water tower? As a utility, for utility purposes. Well, and because of the antenna, it would. Which is also a utility, right. Right. On the um, town's tax records, the, it's a sizable assessed value, and the building is excessively more than the land. Hmm. Um, I've only gone back a few years, but the point being is that the town sees it as, apparently, as a tower, water tower, and it says next to, um, property type utilities. Uh, parking the water, whether it is or is not a water tower, isn't the 
gateway question is the what district we're talking about, what type of use is going to be uh, looked at. I can so, imagine that utility uses aren't allowed everywhere. I, I appreciate that. But if we're looking at the RA district, um, and this is, let's say it's grandfathered, or it's been, it's been there from the 40s, um, can it continue as it is? Arguably, yes. And then the, has there been a request for modification? And so is that the, really the crux of the question, is what type of modification that we're looking at, and if it's inside the four corners of the current use, it should not be a problem. So if we're, if we're outside those four corners, such as the, the shed, a little wider at the top, maybe even a little taller, isn't that uh, further non-conformance, whether in use or, or building shape and size? Are you saying that because it's now being used as support for an antenna, that it's not any change if you're going to add more antennas to the structure itself? I'm thinking, I haven't crystallized I my position, but I'm saying that this three-dimensional three structure is fixed. Before the applicants came, before, uh, before they submitted to any dialogue. And because it's a residential district, it cannot change any further away from a residential lot. So if it, if it if, if does, um, I think there was an application a while back where the second story was a little wider than it was originally on a, on a remodeling. And we had a discussion about expanding the second story nonconformance. Right? So Is that, this a nonconforming lot or a nonconforming use though? The water tower. It's, it, it's a nonconforming lot. It's a, it's a small lot. It's, it's too an, small, the, but it's not a nonconforming use. No, it is okay. not. Be a public utility, essential utility service. Yes. For the water tower, I'm not talking about the, or the wireless telecommunications. Uh, I'm sorry. I, I believe it's a non-conforming use as well, um, under the basis of the definition. Which one? Non-conforming use. No, which which use? Sorry. Right. Uh, the way I see it, it could be whatever it may be, in, in the 1940s. It's a, it's a water tower. Because I don't, I'm, I'm, I'm troubled with the antenna is just sticking on top, uh, changes the, the, the object nature of it. So if it's, uh, on my interpretation of reading non-conforming use definition, it is a water tower, it's per permitted, because it's pre-existing prior to the ordinance. And you would not be able to create another water tower today on that location. If you're the Portland Water District? And let's say that that lot on Avon Road was just a field. Can you come in today and put a, a water tower on that? Assuming dimensionally you could, you could meet setbacks and so forth. It wouldn't, wouldn't that meet? Uh, wouldn't that be a public utility, essential utility services use? Uh, assuming that they have the same setbacks for all residential, uh, the RA district. All right, but the way I, I have. Based on that overview map, and this is C1, um, the setbacks are fairly tight. And I would expect current day setbacks to be a little more broader. But I don't have a dispute. If, if, if there's a utility going in, fine. But it still has to meet the other requirements. So my query is that can you, can you pick any lot in town and that's in a residential RA district? And if it's a field, can you put a water tower there? And the answer is yes, but and so how do you get the jurisdictional threshold to get in to build the water tower? Okay. That's my thoughts. I'll just leave it there.
I come back to uh, a question that you raised, Mr. Chairman? Um, what's the board opinion on sort of our ability to interpret the federal law that's been submitted to us? I mean, on one, on one point, I do understand Ben made a, a ruling as to whether or not the application sort of complied with it, but um, it seems, at least on the surface, pretty clear to me that uh, we're to review the, our decisions are based on our ordinance and not necessarily on, on the spectrum act. I mean, that, that's, that, that's, that's the way I read powers that we have under the ordinance. I mean, I, obviously, there, I mean, you know, permitting then has other powers, and, and obviously the planning board has other powers, but right now, I don't see how we have the power to grant an appeal based on something that's not in the ordinance, or the interpretation of the ordinance, or our decision of how the ordinance reads. I think that it would be a mistake to not consider our ordinance in the context of the two applicable federal statutes and to determine whether or not the application of our ordinance is in compliance with those statutes. Whether application of the ordinance is, is whether our ordinance complies no, with the federal statute? No, whether how we're applying our ordinance. For example, with regard to the 1996 Telecommunications Act, has it been established that there's a gap in coverage? To the extent that there are criteria out there that would apply to our decision, I think we should consider that. Why? Um, because there's a ton of case law out there that says that if we don't, we're going to get bounced. <laughs> so does, I mean, your belief is that we have power outside of the express power that's given to us by the ordinance? In other words, we can apply law other than the ordinance to... Our ordinance has to be applied consistent with those federal statutes, otherwise it would be preempted. But is that our determination? Is that, is that for the It's board? our application of the ordinance. I guess that really only becomes an issue. I mean, if, if we find that if we're going to grant the appeal under the ordinance, we don't necessarily get to federal preemption issues. I mean, if we, if we find that. Sure. I mean, I think maybe stick to the issue of alternative before we get to. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think if, I think if, if we, we, we don't need to get to that until we determine that under the ordinance, we would not be granting the appeal. Mm -hmm. If we determine that, we, if we're going to deny the appeal under the ordinance, then I think we need to take the next step of going to the Spectrum Act and discussing, pre discussing preemption and discussing whether or not we have those powers. But um, I think we can stick to the ordinance, at least in the first instance. Yeah, I, I guess if that's the case, um, if, if we go back to sort of Ben's letter of August 23rd, 2013, where he, uh, he determines that, in fact, the old power is not a 
alternative power structure because it's not primarily used for purposes other than to support the antenna. I, I think that's, uh, I mean, I know we've heard a lot of arguments tonight, but there was a letter provided from the Portland Water District under tab six of Ms. Barraza's application. Uh, in which the water district uh, the, the, the water district says the tank has only been used by the district to operate a communications antenna. So I think it's pretty clear why it's there. And the dis the our, district. I think our ordinance is pretty clear in its definition of alternative tower structure. That it needs to be, it needs to do something other than support an antenna. And then this gets back to the issue that I had raised was, is that to support the antenna that is intended to be placed on the structure that's being built? Or is that in addition primarily for purposes other than to support an antenna that happens to be existing there that was placed onto the structure? Yeah. How about the antennas in 2007. Are we considering that those installation and use of those antennas now grandfathered? Or because that, isn't that part of the hook upon which the application is applying? I think it's a separate issue. I think that's a very good question. But so if it's water. So if I think Ben, ben is getting to that when you question some additional information from the water district, is that, is that sort of what you're getting at? Yeah. Yes. I was trying to determine if, if it was le uh, legally conforming, legally non-conforming. There, there, there's a lot of gray area. All right. Let's assume that the antennas, just for current purposes, are not on the tower. So it's non. Even if they're there, let's say there's a non. There's a water tower that is not being used with for water. Right, and that there is antennas that we would describe as non-conforming. The use of the antennas is a non-conforming use of the water tower. Is that the right statement? The, the existing antennas there? Yes. So let's assume that the tower is properly built in there. Predates all of us. Fine. So now in 2007, the question now arises, then the um, water district have to seek permission to put the antennas on the water tower. That's an open question. So now the question is, all right, so the current application seeks to use the benefit of the antennas on the water tower to modify the site to, to, to use it as they wish. Am I right? OK, four blank stairs. Well, I, I mean, I don't know. I mean, the, the, uh, under one interpretation, the existing antenna yes. could be a problem because it is no longer an alternative tower. There's a, you can read up the alternative tower structure definition to create a problem for the appellants who are arguing that this is an alternative tower structure, but there already is an antenna there, the primarily for purposes other than to support an antenna. Yes. So that's one issue. If the antenna is there, that could create a problem. Okay, but I, uh, all right. So is the other problem is that we have to assume that the tower, the antennas that are currently there, are either lawfully there or not. I guess I'm looking at it a little differently. Um, um, I guess I'm, from my perspective, it seems to me that it, that the use of the property is and always has been by the Portland Water District for utility purposes. I know. I mean, regardless of whether they did or did not need a permit for the antennas that they added to the existing water tank in 2007, I don't know whether those antennas went on before or after there was water in the tank or wasn't water in the tank. There was tank. a boat. There was a boat. I think that was 1985. Yes. So, yeah, I think there was. Certainly when there was water in the tank. But it's all a utility so you, use by the Portland Water District. It's all kind of part of their operations. It's what they're doing. It's utility. It's an allowed use. It's a conforming use. 
Then the question is, is this alternative tower structure a accessory or a principal use? And that's where I'm really struggling because it seems to me that, yes, there's a utility use going on there, but it is about to become subordinate to a much more intensive use. In terms of volume, frequency of this, in kind of every, every aspect. Every aspect. And that's Additional where structures I'm, on, on mm -hmm, the lot, mm -hmm, more, in, mm -hmm, more antennas. Mm -hmm. And then even assuming that you get past that, I also am struggling with the definition of alternative power structure, which seems to me to require entire concealment. I understand now that that would be something that would go to the planning board, but I, I mean, basically where I am, with all due respect then, is that I disagree with your answer to question one in August 23, 2013. I do think there's some gray area there, but then I agree with you on your answer to question number two, which is that the alternative power structure can only be an accessory use. And then the definition of accessory use is such that it needs to be incidental and subordinate. So you believe it is an alternative power structure, but... Uh, well, to the extent, I agree with Ben there as well, but to the extent it may or may not be an alternative tower structure, there's then the concealment issue. And to me, if you're saying that the equipment shed is part of the alternative tower structure, which is the only way that it would be permitted, it couldn't be an accessory use to an accessory use, presumably, then it would have to be concealed, and it clearly is not. some consensus that the use would not be incidental and subordinate or that the principal use would become subordinate to the accessory accessory uses is that I'm just trying to get a sense of where where we are and if there's some issues here that we have agreement on I'm content with Joanna's uh, discussion just shortly, moments ago. I'm troubled with how we're going to, the preemption federal law point, how that works yes. in, but um, um, and, it, and is that, is, is, is it that it, a use that is incidental, that the use would not be incidental and subordinate at the outset, or is it that the principal use would become subordinate when aggregated. I mean, it, I don't know if I'm splitting hairs here or if it's not, if that's a distinction without a difference, but. Well, as we said moments earlier, when we first began, it will always be a water tower. Right. So then it's a subsidiary use. Is that the, what page you Accessory. Use? Accessory. You, you feel it will, would be an accessory use? It would meet the definition? Because I thought Joanna was saying that it would not. It would be an accessory of an accessory, which is a problem. Right, so I don't, it, as it's set out here, I don't think it meets the definition. It's, it's once removed, I think. Because of the existing antenna? Yes. That's an accessory use? Yes. And then adding more antennas would be an accessory to that accessory use? I'm not saying I agree with that. I'm just trying to parse out. Well, the use of the two sets of antennas, if you want to call it like that, are the, the purposes are different. And the, the population upon which they serve are different. So I think that it would be, I see them as different. Although they fall in the category of antenna, but it's, the purposes is different. 
So I would more inclined to say this. How did you describe it? An accessory? To an accessory? Yes. I don't know what that is. But What's the uh, paragraph thing like that? <laughs> well, I mean, the if we go to so 1961, Residence A District RA, permitted uses. And B4 is the following, what these are the permitted uses, the following accessory uses are permitted uses. G, commercial wireless telecommunication service antenna, which is attached to an alternative tower structure in a manner which conceals the presence of an antenna. So built into that language is the definition of antenna, the definition of alternative power structure, um, and then also it, it's not allowed unless, the, unless it's concealed, unless it's built into, attached to, sorry, attached to the alternative power structure in a manner which conceals the presence of an antenna. And I mean, the, the definition of accessory use is a use that is incidental and subordinate to the principal use. The principal use shall not become subordinate to accessory uses when aggregated. So I mean, first, I think to, to break this down and to start doing this in order, I think we have to determine as a threshold, is it an accessory use? Is it incidental and subordinate to the principal use? So what's the, what is the principal use? Is it, as Joanna says, as it's a, it's the principal use is generally by the water district for its operation as a utility, whether it's water or an antenna for its meters, it's just this general use by the water district as its operation as a utility. That's what it is now. That's all it is now, right? I mean, they've said it. They're not going to use it anymore as a water to hold water. I mean, I guess that could change, but the general use right now, the primary, or not the primary, the principal use is by the water district. by the water district as for general utility essential services uses okay we have is generally the board the board on board with that definition or yes. that characterization okay So that's the principal use. Would this use be incidental and subordinate to that? So would the installation of the antenna, would it be incidental and subordinate to that? And then the second question is that the principal use by the water district cannot become subordinate to the accessory use when aggregated. The problem that I have with that is once you put up those cell phone or those, those cell cellular antennas and you build the structure on the lot, I have a hard time viewing that as incidental and subordinate. Once they're there, it's it, it seems that once they're there, they're there, and that suddenly becomes the main purpose of the lot. 
and it is for the water district and it is for the because the water district is getting thirty thousand. I mean, it's for user. Yep. I think the water district, water district might argue now that the primary use is their proprietary system to monitor the sewer pumping stations, but that's not to say that in a number of years that they go to a different system that renders those antennas useless and they basically remove that their current utility use from the tower completely and it becomes only a cell tower. Sure. But right now I think that that is their primary, their primary use. For monitoring in their for operation as a It's important for them for their purpose and then hey if they can get a little bit of rent for it that's what they're looking for. In order to change that use to a non-conforming use though they would need a variance. Okay. So if the principal use is by the water desk for general utility, general utility essential services usage, and the installation of the antenna is not incidental and subordinate to that principal use, then isn't, aren't we at least under the ordinance? Do we need to go any further? I think it's, I, yeah, for I, me, it's installation of the antenna and the equipment shed. I mean, what I think of as a wireless telecommunications facility, which is not a defined term in our ordinance. Okay. So, sorry, installation of the antenna and... It's the whole, I mean, it's a, it's for the, our purposes, we define it all, I guess, as the tower. Well, I mean, that's an interesting, I mean, antenna is defined as any structure or device used for the purposes of collecting or radiating electromagnetic waves. So I guess it's Does that, the antenna. Would, would the yeah. unit that's housed in the structure would be part of the antenna? I guess so. Because yeah. that's... But, yeah, I, I think I don't disagree. But couldn't the argument be made that the, the building, which they've made an effort to sort of comply with the feel of the neighborhood by doing it with cedar shakes and peak roof is in essence concealing the equipment inside. But I mean, what's the difference between but a fence but concealing or it inside what? They're not concealing it within the alternative tower structure, which is the water tower. No, no, no. I... I think the, the well, I think the argument could be made. I mean, how, how would you conceal with perhaps a fence or perhaps, I mean, putting it in the water tower or vegetation or something like that? Or I think the argument could be made that building, putting a building but structure I think, around the equipment is in fact concealing. But are we even... Are but we our even? definition of alternative tower structure is interesting in that I agree with you that G of whatever it is, Nineteen six one. Yeah, yeah. B um, four. B four G specifies that the presence of the antenna needs to be concealed, mm -hmm. but that's within the alternative tower structure. And then, if you look separately at the definition of alternative tower structure, it requires that the water tower be that. So it says mounting towers, mounting structures such as, but not limited to, the blah blah blah, water towers, comma that conceal the presence of antennas or towers and which are used primarily for purposes other than to support an antenna. Ah, I see. I so see what you're saying now. Yeah. It seems to me that the alternative tower structure needs to conceal the antenna. To the extent we're saying that the equipment shed, which is not otherwise mentioned, is part of the antenna, Understood. and it's within our definition of antenna, which is any structure or device used for the purpose of collecting or radiating electromagnetic waves, including but not limited to da, 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 yeah, da, which gets back to that would example then need to be concealed within the alternative sure. tower structure. Which, which gets back to the example of putting equipment in the basement of a church or something right. like that. Yeah, yeah. No, that, but I see where you're I see where you're reading that now. And particularly where as here in the Sims at C let's see. Yeah. In the Galdana packet you can see on the first page, the simulation, you've got an equipment shed that dominates the existing separate structure. I mean, it would be one thing if that were the equipment shed and there was no new structure. That, to me, would be part of the existing water tower structure. If it, that was, with, if it was within that shed, shed exactly. the existing shed. But instead, there's the addition of a new larger shed, which is sure. not concealed. Sure. I mean, yes, it has a peaked roof, 
mm -hmm. um, and clabbered, but it's visually obvious. The, the concealment issue is, I mean, you know, we were discussing accessory use, which it seems like the board does not believe it is an accessory use. The, the in, installation of the antenna, antennas. Um, concealment is a, another issue. But, yeah. And I guess kind of a, a question for the board is, do we, I mean, if, if we determine that it is not an accessory use, then it, we don't, don't get there. we don't grant the appeal. Do we move forward and have other findings with respect to, you know, it's not concealed, that's another way that we would um, deny the appeal. Or do we stop when we get to the following accessory uses? It's not an accessory use because it's not going to be incidental and subordinate. Full stop. I, I'm not. I'm not fully convinced that it's not an accessory use, but I. Okay. I know, well, I know some. I know others are. Um, it, I mean, you I don't think it's. I think there's a gray area there. Um, clearly, it's a. Today, it's a. It's utility used for public utility essential services by the Portland Water District. Whether or not these, um, the antennas, the cell antennas go on, or not, it's going to continue to be used by the Portland Water District for those same uses um, but and you don't think that use would suddenly become subordinate because there's two because there's more of them and it's a high two telecommunication companies that have now installed their antennas and built again remember that they're building one the the um picture we have here is, is that's, no I, I understand and so for you either have to have multiple sheds or a larger shed um, that's just where I start to I start to have difficulty defining that as incidental and subordinate to what right now are a few antenna at the top, and that's basically it. Yeah, no, I, I completely understand that side of the argument. I, I, I guess back to your question of findings, I, I would, if, if the board does find that it's not an accessory use, but it, it, uh, it does in fact, or, or the accessory use sort of becomes uh, subordinate, um, I, I would encourage that we uh, also make findings on the concealment uh, side of things as well. I think it's a, I think it's a good point that clearly when you look at the definition of alternative tower structure, um, the structure itself is supposed to conceal the presence of antennas, and I think the structure probably does fall under that definition of antenna. I think the two go hand in hand too. I mean, frankly, I think that to the extent this the new use were more concealed, it would be more subordinate. If that equipment shed didn't dwarf <laughs> the other shed, then it would be, I mean, if we were just talking, the, About just what's the, panels just the panels in the Sims, then it's, to me, it's a different discussion in terms of the accessory nature of the use in terms of footprint, in terms of visual impact, in terms of volume, in terms of... I would agree. And I mean, the, the concealment comes up both 
in 4G, commercial wireless telecommunication service antenna, which is attached to an alternative power structure in a manner which conceals the presence of an antenna. And then the concealment is also built into the definition of alternative power structure. It's twice, I mean, it's basically, mm -hmm. it needs to be concealed to be an alternative power structure and it needs to be concealed to be permitted as an accessory use. Right. We have general consensus on the board that it's not concealed. Not concealed. So both the accessory use is not concealed and it doesn't fit into the definition of alternative power structure. Because it's not. It's required by necessity, it means it's not concealed. Is that right? So that's just a query as to fleshing out whether we actually got this correct. So if it's concealed, it means that the current footprint is being utilized and the current shape and form is being utilized. So if you see if you need to ask for a variance, is it concealed anymore? Are they asking for a variance or just No, I'm just testing the hypothesis that we have a, a proper determination that are, um, for example, the panels inside the shed are concealed because they're in the shed. Okay. So now the question is, is this, does the shed have to be concealed? And does, does it have to be, on the, you know, where the other shed is? Does it have to be inside the tank itself, uh, the, the tower? So that's my query, just to make sure that when we, when we are looking at the word conceal, we're perhaps overanalyzing the word, but I think the way we have set it out originally is that that's the correct way. It has to be as if there has been no change. So if you're asking for a variance, it means that it's not concealed, because you have to enlarge in the shape as, or whatever structure you have to add for, for the antennas. That's the point. I think I understand what you're saying. Okay. We'll move it on. Okay. Where are we now? Um, I mean, I think at least because of the lack of concealment, the accessory use is not concealed. It also doesn't meet the definition of alternative tower structures because it is not concealed. At least there's consensus on the board under the ordinance we would deny the appeal because it's not concealed. I don't think there's anything else, I, unless somebody disagrees, I don't think we have to do any other analysis underneath the ordinance at this time. But I think that does then trigger the Spectrum Act and the preemption issue and basically the next step in the analysis. Everybody agree? Okay. John. <laughs> Would you mind um, if you could help There's us out here letter. a little bit? What's that? There's a letter at uh, Four in the Geraldina packet, yep. dated March 19, 2014. On page two, there's a fairly fulsome discussion of the limits on our kind of 
Where, where are we now? Sorry, in, in the Vero Dana packet yep. at tab four. Yep. Page two. Yes. It's a February 20th, 2014 letter yep. from the town. Oh, I'm sorry. The dates are wonky. Um, the date of the letter is March 19, 2014, but then on the top of the next page it says February 20th, 2014. Yep. Okay. Sorry. So in there, there is a fairly fulsome discussion of the um, applicability or inapplicability, as the case may be, of the Spectrum Act. Are you saying we don't need to get to John because? No. Oh. <laughs> I haven't read that. Sure. Yes, take mine. I think the question to me is whether or not um, the board has the authority to construe any kind of law outside of its ordinance in terms of applying its ordinance. Um, and clearly there are certain legal questions that are outside the purview of the zoning board. Um, one that comes to mind that we've had, I think, in past hearings is uh, the board's not authorized to make determinations about uh, private property rights, effective easements, and things of that nature. Um, the issue of the impact of state and federal law as it applies to and possibly uh, preempts uh, ordinances um, has a little different status, I believe. Um, I've looked at, just briefly this evening, it was, it was not an issue that I had looked at coming in here, but um, the law court back in 2000, in a case called Sawyer Environmental Town of Hampton, indicated that state law concerning um, transfer stations and landfills, um, uh, those provisions which conflicted with the local ordinance um, controlled. Now, there were specific preemption language in that statute, and it certainly discussed with a little more detail the interaction between local ordinance and state law. But, but I, I think the, what I took away from that decision was the fact that the law court reversed and sent back the issue to the, the local board uh, on the grounds of, of a preemption issue and that the preemption applied and therefore affected its ability to enforce certain aspects of its ordinance. So taking from that decision, I, I think it's, it's fair and and probably necessary for the board to consider what the impact of the, the argued preemption would have on the enforceability of the, the local ordinance. And I don't know if there's anything else specific to that you wanted me to address, but. Thanks, John.
guess I'm not seeing um, where it has been established that the water tower is a existing base station or a um, existing wireless tower under this, as those terms are defined under this spectrum act. And so it's not clear to me why the spectrum act would apply. Spectrum Act to apply, we have to find that it's a request for a modification of an existing, there has to be an existing wireless tower or base station. The argument of Verizon and at t is that the water tower is, but it's, it is a base station because of the antennas that have been installed by the water district. I guess they, I didn't hear that argument clearly made. Um, to the extent there is a, to the extent that argument was made. Um, well, I'm just look. I, I mean, in the, in the submission, the April 16th, 2014 submission, uh, page five, two A, the existing PWD SCADA equipment is a wireless base station. So that's. It's a wireless what? A wireless base station. Mm. So that is the argument that's being made. Um, there is a, in the um, Brandon Isaacson submission, dated May 19, 2014, on page four, Sub two. There's discussion of what terms are and are not defined, and a countervailing argument that um, the water tank would not solely because of the existence of the SCADA system constitute an existing base station? Nearly every available definition of that term, existing base station, requires a base station to be part of a mobile network. Is that what you're mm -hmm. reading? Mm -hmm. I mean, my inclination is to agree with that. That's not a mobile base station simply because the Portland Water District has installed its SCADA equipment on the water tower. That doesn't, from my understanding, based on what I'm reading, what I've heard, um, that doesn't turn it into a base station as defined or as contemplated by the um, spectrum. I agree. I mean, given that there's no definition of existing base statement, base station, and that the only kind of support for the Verizon's conclusion that putting a sending and receiving antenna on a property constitutes a base station is in guidance that could be read narrowly. It could, it's certainly non-binding. Right. 
it's not part of the spectrum map. No. Any other thoughts from the board on this issue? I agree. I think the uh, intent of the ad in the first place is to allow explanation. It sounds like we have consensus from the board on that. It actually, even beyond that, I think uh, just the very fact that the facilities on the ground will be expanded is a great thing. Kind of puts it there. Like I was saying earlier, just the engine, just the engine, the power. The building has been built at the bottom and the future. Um. I'd like to make a motion. Are we there? I mean, are we there yet? It seems like we've analyzed under the statute and determined that the Spectrum Act does not apply. It probably applies, but the requirements for it, we do not meet the threshold requirements. Right? So we right. don't meet the definitions of what there is. I'm saying that because we're talking about preemption, so it, either you're on it I or okay. Well, we close board discussion. Unless the question is not yet. Yeah. Is there any discussion regarding all these arguments? If I understand it correctly. Which, which argument? The, the argument that simply our ordinance. Uh, He's making a TCA argument. Okay. Close gap. That the ordinance is not allowing? I, it, it very well, I mean, that's not. There are other means to change the ordinance. The ordinance is what the ordinance is, and our task is to apply the ordinance. So, <clears throat> if under the under our interpretation of the ordinance, we are denying the appeal, it, that may be the result of it, but it's not for this board to determine. Yeah, I don't. I mean, there are. Um multiple available locations in town on which wireless telecommunications facilities are permitted, including possibly this one. We are finding under our ordinance that it is that the proposed facility by Verizon, because we don't have a full application in front of us before ATC, such that they could establish or not establish a TCA claim, is I mean, there's not enough of an application from ATT establishing whether there is or is not coverage in that area and whether there are or are not facilities that they have proposed that have been turned down by the town. The only SIMs that we have are for another facility. There's no SIMs for their facility that show what their equipment shed would look like, whether it falls within our definition as we're discussing for Verizon here or not. I, mean, I do think that that may be worthwhile to call out separately in to the extent we're doing these as a kind of conglomerated denial, sounds like is the way we're going, then there are substantial differences in the yeah, two yeah. applications. Yeah, and I think we'll, we'll deal with that as we go through the finding of fact. Mm -hmm. But we should call that out with regard, I mean, with regard to the definitions and the applicability of the exceptions.
accessory use definition, we have enough information to make a determination on where that falls down for Verizon. Right. We don't even have enough information from DCT to get there. Right. I agree. Any other board discussion? Okay. To close the board discussion and um, Anybody like to make a motion? Let's, well, anybody like to make a motion? Do we want to do two separate ones, or do we want to do them all at once? I mean, I think we have to reopen discussion. <laughs> Sorry. That's. Anyway. I could move, oh, move and then you could move. Sure. reject me. <laughs> well, do you want to move to reopen discussion to talk ah, a little sure. bit? Sure. I move that we reopen a procedural discussion on how to issue our findings. Second. All in favor? All right. So we'll reopen discussion. I think particularly because part of our decision is turning on concealment. And from Verizon, we have sufficient materials before the board to determine that the antenna and its associated structures, or the antenna itself, however you define it, is not concealed as required. But from AT&T, we do not have anything in with respect to the structure and how it's going to be installed that we should do two separate findings and two separate um, you know, motions okay close close the discussion mm -hmm. all right would anybody like to make a motion let's start with Verizon I might like to make a motion on the Verizon application I'll move that we deny the administrative appeal of Verizon Wireless regarding the code enforcement officer's decision to deny a building permit at 11 Avon Road. Do I have a second? Nah. All in favor? Okay. Five in favor. Not opposed. Okay, I'll, I'm going to go through the findings of fact that we have here, and then we'll work up the additional findings of fact. Um, this is an administrative appeal of the code enforcement officer's decision to deny a building permit requ request me, to deny a building permit requesting to add wireless telecommunication antennas and an associated equipment building to the property of 11 Avon Road, Map U12, Lot 12. Two, the applicant is Verizon Wireless, who is acting based on an agreement with the property owner, Portland Water District. Three, the property has an old water tower on it that is no longer used for water storage. Four, on March 19, 2014, the code enforcement officer issued the letter of denial. Five, on April 16, 2014, Verizon Wireless submitted the administrative appeal application. So additional findings of fact. The applicant has failed to demonstrate that the proposed use would be an accessory use as defined at section 19-6-1 C 
sub B, sub 4, sub G. Um, okay. I'm okay with that. Any other? Everybody else okay with that one? Any other? We want to add before that, sorry, that wireless telecommunication antennas and associated equipment buildings are permitted in the RA district where the property is located only as accessory uses. Yes. Can you say that again? <laughs> <laughs> Wireless. Wireless telecommunication antennas and associated equipment building as proposed by the applicant as a alternative power structure are only permitted in the RA district where the property is located as an accessory use. Okay, and do we want to say, I, and this is just because of the definition of antenna in the ordinance, do we want to say um, antennas and associate equipment buildings? I, I guess that's fine. I, mean, it, I was just using the language from the first signing of that. That's where that came from. Sorry. <laughs> Let's go with that. Um, okay. So we have uh, wireless telecommunication antennas and associated equipment buildings as proposed by the applicant as an alternative power structure are only permitted in the RA district where the property is located as an accessory use and the applicant has failed to demonstrate that the proposed use would be an accessory use as defined by section 19-6-1 sub B4G. We also want to add, I think we all agree that the structure doesn't meet the definition of as proposed as an Yeah, I think that the um we also want to add that the wireless telecommunication antennas and associated equipment building proposed by the applicant, the applicant has not established that those fall within the definition of um, alternative tower structure. The applicant has not demonstrated. Mm -hmm that the wireless telecommunication antennas and associated equipment building. sorry associated equipment building building and what was the last end of that i'm sorry meet the definition meet the of, alternative. of alternative power structure Primarily, I think that was because we found that, that was due to the fact that we felt that the proposal or the proposed uh, tenants and associated structure weren't concealed. Not wasn't really concealed. Because, because the because said antennas and associated equipment building we're not concealed we're not concealed so the applicant has not demonstrated that the wireless telecommunication antennas and associated equipment building meet the definition of alternative tower structure because said antennas and associated equipment building are are not we're not con are not concealed we're not are we're not proposed We're not proposed to be concealed. Okay. Concealed adequately, I, I don't know. 
word that it says. I think it's probably fine to say it doesn't mean it says the next one. Yeah. And then we can see on that part of the Yep. I agree. I think let's strike everything after of alternate does not meet the building. The applicant has not demonstrated that the wireless telecommunication antennas and associated equipment building meet the definition of alternative tower structure, period. I mean, the concealment is, is part of that definition, so. You want to find the facts that are with the accessory use? Yeah, the applicant has failed to demonstrate that the proposed use would be an accessory use as defined by 19.61 B4 sub G. Um, any other findings based on the ordinance? Okay. Findings based on the federal law. Applicant has failed to demonstrate that the spectrum act is applicable to the to the proposed well this to say it doesn't apply right I, I think we want to say that I think we probably want to talk about base station it hasn't mm -hmm. doesn't um, it's not established that the property is an existing base station it's not established that subject property is well it's not that it has not established that the property is a base station is pursuant to the Spectrum Act. Yeah, Another yeah. class tax relief. Hold on, Spectrum. So the Spectrum Act is the shorthand, and then what's the full? Middle class tax relief. Middle class tax. Yep. And Job Creation Act. Do you have a citation too? I don't. Right. I think we're okay. <laughs> Sure, someone gave me one. Seven USC fourteen fifty five. Okay. Um, do you want to include that provision? Um, Twelve phrases of the first year. This would be fourteen fifty five. Is that the first uh, The provision that I come my attention is does not substantially change the physical dimensions of the of such tower or base station. Say it again. Sorry, Brandon Isaacs, Isaac, so, uh, page four in the middle. That's the provision that we're talking about. I think you just provided that citation. I think that's a follow-up finding. So, even to the extent it was an existing base station, what is being imposed would substantially change it and therefore would not be required. Do you want to make that finding? Two people have talked about it. 
Okay. I guess we didn't as well. So we it. <laughs> much. Um, that section is six four zero nine. Six four zero nine. Sorry, that's the um, public law. I'm guessing sixty four zero nine, not the USC site. Right. Yeah. Codified at forty seven USC fourteen fifty five. I'm sorry. The footnote two has the proper citation. Subsection A and two. Okay, so the finding, the first finding on the Spectrum Act was the applicant has not established that the property is an existing base station. Pursuant to the Spectrum Act, Middle Class Tax Relief and Job Creation Act of 2012, 47 USC 1455. Right. To the extent that it is a base station, it does meet the definition. To the extent it did qualify as an existing base station, given the current condition of the property. I'm, I don't know if this is a finding or additional. Um, the next criterion would be that it would only be required to if there was not a substantial change. So I think what we're trying to do is, is we're saying first that it's not a base station under the definition. But if somebody were to find that it were a base station, then it still doesn't meet the requirements of not of not making a substantial change. So to the extent that it did, I'm not sure how we word that. To the extent that it does, it's an alternative. yeah, it's like an alternative finding, basically. Mm -hmm. To the extent that it does qualify, the extent that even if the applicant had established that it was an existing okay. wireless tower or base station? Even if the applicant had established that it was an existing base station or... Which we, or what? Existing wireless tower or base station. Existing wireless tower or base station. Which we have found they did not. Which we have found they did not. The submitted plans submitted document plans. substantial changes to the existing physical dimension of the property. Structure, structures or property? Okay, so for under the federal law, we have um, the applicant has not established that the property is an existing base station pursuant to the Spectrum Act, Middle Class Tax Relief and Job Creation Act of 2012, 47 USC 1455. Even if the applicant had established that it was an existing wireless tower or base station, um, which we have found they did not. The submitted plans document substantial changes to the existing physical dimensions of the structure. Therefore, the Spectrum Act does not apply. 
or I mean, are we just just stating that? Is there a conclusion based? I mean, do we follow even the even if the applicant had established that the existing wireless? I guess no, because it's a it's a under it's pursuing to the Spectrum Act, or I mean, I think that's fine. Or make it an A under eight or whatever the last one was. So it's clear we're talking about the Spectrum Act. Is that what you're concerned about? Yeah, I mean, it's it's basically another reason for right. denying mm -hmm. the application or the appeal. So I just want to tie it back to I, I, we could say under the even if the applicant had established that it was an existing wireless tower or base station, which we have found they did not. The submitted plans document substantial changes to the existing physical dimensions of the structure. Yeah, maybe we do want to reference back to the Spectrum Act at the beginning, or such that it would not be. Un we well. I mean, I'm just looking at the link. Such that we would not be required to approve it under the Spectrum Act. So even if the applicant had established that it was an existing wireless tower or base station, we have found that they didn't, which we have found they did not. The submitted plans document substantial changes to the existing physical dimensions of the structure, such that we would not be required to approve it under the Spectrum Act. I'm okay with that. Any other additional findings? all of the additional findings and then we'll vote on them. So we've already done the first five, six. Wireless tele telecommunication antennas and associated equipment buildings as proposed by the applicant as an alternative tower structure are only permitted in the RA district where the property is located as an accessory use. Seven, the applicant has failed to demonstrate that the proposed use would be an accessory use as defined at section 19-6-1 B, 4, G. Eight, the applicant has not demonstrated that the wireless telecommunication antennas and associated equipment building meet the definition of alternative tower structure. Nine, the applicant has not established that the property is an existing base station pursuant to the Spectrum Act, Middle Class Tax Relief and Job Creation Act of 2012, 47 USC 1455, and 10, even if the applicant had established that it was an existing wireless tower or base station, which we have found they did not, the submitted plans document substantial changes to the existing physical dimensions <coughs> of the structures such that we would not be required to approve it under the Spectrum Act. So all in favor of the finding? Wait. Okay. Um, it's not necessarily an increasing of the dimensions, it's an addition. Point, whether they just, uh, the, the other, um, the second building on the ground, ground level, so it's an addition, it's not an expansion, whether that is material for the, for the findings of fact. For this last finding of fact? Yes. <clears throat> the submitted plans document substantial so how are you proposing that we We say something like, does not, we mirror the language in the statute. And so it's not just that provision, it's a, um, Where are you looking, just? Sorry, it's the um, page four. The Brown and Isaacs one? Yeah. Okay. Does not substantially change 
the physical dimensions of the power, the tower or the base station. The query weather does not substantially change or add. Uh, I leave it as is. Okay. Okay, now it's a little complicated. I mean, this doesn't, I mean, the language that you're quoting doesn't have add, right? Just change. Okay. Yep. So, all in favor of the findings of fact? That's five, nothing? Okay, so I think we need to move on to AT&T. Mm -hmm. Do I have a motion? Okay. Um, a motion regarding AT&T. deny the administrative appeal of um, ATT's administrative appeal of the code enforcement officer's decision to deny a building permit requesting to add wireless telecommunication antennas and associated equipment building to the property at 11 Avon Road. I second that motion. All in favor? That's five nothing. Nine the appeal. Uh, the findings of fact. Um, number one, this is an administrative appeal of the code enforcement officer's decision to deny a building permit <clears throat> requesting to add wireless telecommunication antennas and an associated equipment building to the property at 11 Avon Road, map U12, lot 12. Two, the applicant is... New Singular Wireless, PCS, LLC parentheses AT&T Mobility LLC, who is acting based on an agreement with the property owner, Portland Water District. Do we have a copy of that agreement in the record? For AT&T? Uh, I know that no. Attorney Anderson gave it to us for Portland Water District, but I never saw it for um, AT&T. That's correct. So we don't have any TRI either. That's correct. Okay. Do we even need to proceed then? Proceed Sorry. what? There's no right title or interest in the record. For them to proceed. Mm -hmm. I suggest that we include it as a finding of fact. We can't. It's not in the record. <laughs> There's no lease. We got a lease for Verizon, but we don't have one for AT. We can make a finding that they didn't provide any evidence of right to interest in the record, and then proceed from there accordingly. Accordingly, based on the fact that they didn't? Well, we can proceed to make other findings similar to what we found for Verizon, but... Under an assumption that they do? We had a representation earlier that, from, I think from Mr. Anderson, that other companies were going to be um, trying to use this, this location. I do note the hour, but the point being is that we can just maintain the same or similar findings of fact with the, the ob um, obvious statement that the, the, a critical piece of evidence is not before us. I would be fine with saying that I would not be fine with saying that we have the two. two. I mean, the that they're acting based on an agreement with the property owner, Portland Water District, given that we don't have. Right. No, I mean, and we don't have that. No, we strike out. We could strike that and say, you know, no evidence of an agreement was presented before. Well, okay. So we'll start by just striking that.
So that was God finding one. <laughs> We're okay with that, right? Administrative appeal deny of the denial. So then two, the property has an old water tower on it that is no longer used for water storage. Three, on May 2nd, 2014, the code enforcement officer issued the letter of denial. Four, on May 13th, 2014, Barry Hobbins Esquire submitted the administrative appeal application on behalf of new singular wireless PCS LLC. Can I ask a yes. yes. Under additional findings, if you start off by saying the, the following findings and conclusions are based on the fact that AT&T has a valid agreement with Portland Water District, but that has not yet been demonstrated, and then continue with the findings. I'm just looking to see if the application even says that. Was that said to you, anyway? Uh, yes, it was said to me. next month if we kick it out on that oh no I'm not saying to kick it out on that I'm just saying that uh, I mean it's not in here hmm? it's not in here mm -hmm. the application form that's at the end does reference that the owner of the property is in the building permit application itself it does reference that the owner is the Portland Water District and that the applicant is new singular wireless. I think we just said, yeah, I mean, there's no we have a lease from the prior matter that indicates that additional four co-locators were being contemplated. We don't have any documentation that indicates that ATC has entered into an agreement to be one of those, let alone whether it's been signed off on by the Portland Water District. And then just proceed, and then just proceed to make the same find similar. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, Yeah, I think. All right, so five. <laughs> um, based on a previous appeal. Mm -hmm. um, it was incorporated by reference by Attorney Hobbins in letter by letter dated May 13, 2014. Well, I mean, but anyway. well, but I mean, he did incorporate by reference their arguments tonight. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, incorporated by reference by letter dated May 13, 2014, and also at the hearing mm -hmm. based on the previous based on the previous appeal. Based on the previous appeal, which was incorporated by reference by Attorney Hobbins by letter dated May 13, 2014, and also at the hearing, we understand that. We proceeded on the basis of that. Yes. We, we proceeded on the basis that AT and T had AT and T, um, we proceed on the basis that AT 
Well, you, a similar contract that was in well, um, So what did you proceed? Go ahead. You proceed on the basis that AT&T has a similar contract. So, hold on a second. That new singular wireless PCS LLC, PBA, AT&T, mobility. Maybe one of the four so we proceeded on the basis that new singular wireless PCS LLC doing business with AT&T Mobility LLC has entered? Maybe. I mean, the best I think we can do is say that they might be one of the four co-locators contemplated by the agreement. That might have. be one of the four co-locators contemplated by the agreement before the board? I think you just got, I think, did you just get that? Yes. So contemplated by this agreement. Okay. Contemplated by the November 18th, 2013 lease. a notice of lease agreement? Okay, so contemplated by the November 18th, 2013 notice of lease agreement between Portland Water District and Portland Cellular Partnership EBA Verizon Wireless. <clears throat> Based on the previous appeal, which was incorporated by reference by Attorney Hobbins by letter dated May 13, 2014, and also at the hearing, we proceeded on the basis that New Singular Wireless PCS LLC DBA AT&T Mobility LLC might be one of the four co-locators co contemplated by the November 18th, 2013 Notice of Lease Agreement between Portland Water District and Portland Cellular Partnership, DBA, Verizon Wireless. Open. I, I mean, this looks to me like it's a structural lease agreement. But it's not part of the record. It's very close to the record. It's probably just left. Yeah, I. I mean, would anybody like to make a motion to open the, I mean, we can, would anybody like to make a motion to reopen the record? I'll make a motion to reopen the record. Anybody second it? I'll second it. Proceed, well, let's discuss, now, I mean, you seconded it, let's, we can now discuss. Okay. I'm not that uncomfortable reopening the record to accept it, simply because we're denying the appeal. So I, I, I just think it makes the record more complete for our denial. And then it avoids the language we're trying to shoehorn into our decision. But wouldn't, wouldn't the, just a simple finding of that, such that the applicant has established a record? Has not? Has not established a record. In addition to all the other ones, is that the basis for so, so what is the document? 
It's a structure lease agreement entered into between Portland Water District and New okay, Singular so Water. It's, it's proposed, by, proposed finding a fact that it was no yeah, ownership yeah. interest. So I would think we just wouldn't have to have that anymore. Because we don't see in the Verizon one if it is. We see in the Verizon one if there is a lease. No, I mean, the language that we used in the Verizon one was just acting based on an agreement with the property owner, Portland Water District. And that's, that's sort of the issue that we ran into here, because yeah. when we were about to read that finding and agree upon that finding, it's we, didn't, it. we didn't have this. So we couldn't find that that at and was acting based on an agreement. Now, at least we have here, which isn't part of the record. It's not. It is not part it's not of at this point in time part of the record. Right. We could choose to change that. I personally don't think that it's appropriate to allow them to cure a clear defect in their appeal after we've closed the record, after the public has left, after they this has been here for consideration as an application. It's a baseline application standard submitting right title and interest to the extent AT&T were to appeal the town to the extent the town would have to expend resources to address that appeal, we would then be curing a very obvious defect with the application after the fact, after the public has left, without the opportunity for public comment that was afforded to the rest of the application. And we would be waiving our own application requirements that would not technically allow us to even have taken new application submissions at the hearing. They should have been submitted and been available for review by the public well in advance of our hearing tonight. Um, oh, but, yep. Okay, I agree. All right, so we had a second on the motion to reopen the hearing to accept the to accept this. I move to exclude the evidence. We have we have a mo we have a motion pending right. to to I don't remember what the motion to, to reopen the record. And it was seconded. All in favor. Okay. So it's zero five. So we are not reopening the record. I think that's I'm not reopening the record, so we're not adding anything to the record. <clears throat> okay, so back to the additional finding. I'm just going to read this again. Now we're going to go back to the... Based on the previous appeal, which was incorporated by reference by Attorney Hobbins by letter dated May 13, 2014, and also at the hearing, we proceeded on the basis that New Singular Wireless PCS LLC, EVA, AT&T Mobility LLC, might be one of the four co-locators contemplated by the November 18, 2013 Notice of Lease Agreement between Portland Water District and Portland Cellular Partnership, EVA, Verizon Wireless. Everybody okay with that? I think the next one needs to be, we did not have, and we have to, we were operating, we proceeded on that basis, but, didn't have the lease. The applicant did not provide evidence of the site. Applicant did not provide evidence of the lease. Any other evidence any of right title or interest? Did not provide any evidence? Any other any other evidence? of right title or right title and interest? Yeah, there's two points of clarification. One, it's implied. The second is that the name is on the, the uh, building application. Is that right? Um, so, so does that rise to the level for the, our purposes of our finance of that? So that there's no evidence. Well, we can just go back to the applicant did not provide, instead of saying did not provide any other evidence, 
which is broad. Yes. We can say the applicant did not provide We go back to the language that was in the proposal, which was the applicant is acting based on an agreement. We can say the applicant did not provide the agreement under which they purported to be acting. The agreement, an agreement, the agreement. The applicant did not provide The applicant did not provide the agreement with the property owner of Portland Water District. That's fine. Okay. Okay. Um, so now we're going back to, and now these differ from the Verizon findings. The next Verizon finding was um, wireless telecommunication antennas and associated equipment buildings as proposed by the applicant as an alternative tower structure only permitted in the R8 district where the property is located as an accessory use. I think that's fine, right? All right, let me just cut and paste. Seven wireless, tele seven, wireless telecommunication antennas and associated equipment buildings as proposed by the applicant as an alternative tower structure are only permitted, are only permitted in the RA district where the property is located as an accessory use. applicant has failed to demonstrate that, that the proposed use would be an accessory use as defined by 1961B4G. That's fine. So eight, the applicant has failed to demonstrate that, that the proposed use would be an accessory use as defined at section 19-6-1B4G. The applicant has not demonstrated that the wireless telecommunication antennas and associated equipment building meet the definition of an alternative tower structure. I think that's fine. Which one had the word existing? We had a finding of fact that had existing. Um, no? That's, that's later. Coming up, okay. Yeah. So, nine, the applicant has failed to demonstrate that the, no, that's, that's the same thing. Nine, the applicant has not demonstrated that the wireless telecommunication antennas and associated equipment building. We're now talking about an associated equipment building, which hasn't even been proposed. So I think that, okay. we're also talking about tele, so this one we might. We talked about that in one. In one. One. This is an administrative appeal. Mm -hmm. But in the application, they do dimensions of proposed structure 12 by 18. So I don't see plans oh. that have structure, but it says in here they proposed structure of 12 feet by 18 feet. Okay. In the application. Okay. Then I'm comfortable with that. Uh, the applicant has not demonstrated that the wireless telecommunication antennas and associated equipment building meet the definition of alternative tower structure.
and then the next one. The applicant has not established that the property is an existing base station pursuant to the Spectrum Act, Middle Class Tax Relief and Job Crea Creation Act of 2012, 47 USC 1455. And then this is the one with existing. So the, the previous one for Verizon Red, even if the applicant had established that it was an existing wireless tower or base station, which we have found they did not, the submitted plans document substantial changes to the existing physical dimensions of the structures such that we would not be required to approve it under the spectrum. It's I mean, if we all look at that's that's the document that I'm looking at. Yep. I mean, this, the building permit application mentions a proposed stru structure of 12 by 18, put an equipment building. And then the uh, affidavit from the RF engineer at paragraph 3 indicates that the panels would go in at 73 feet 9 inches. And then in the testimony, indicated that there would be four sets of, I believe it was three panels each, kind of in between the panels shown on the SIMS for the variety panels. I think based on that, I'm comfortable with the language. Right. Anybody have any further comments? Okay, so 11 is going to be, even if the applicant had established that it was an existing wireless tower or base station, which we have found they did not, the submitted plans document substantial changes to the existing physical dimensions of the structures such that we would not be required to approve it under the spectrum. So all in favor of the finding? I have one more to add for this one. The applicant has not demonstrated that a substantial gap in their wireless coverlet coverage exists pursuant to the Federal Telecommunications Act of 1996, which is 47. Hold on, wait. Um, gap in their wireless coverage exists pursuant to? The Federal Telecommunications Act of 1996. OK, what's the site? 47, USA, section 332, little c, 7. Capital B, little I, capital I, capital I. Like, like Roman numeral I? I. Correct. I have a query on the submission. On the bottom of the third page, there's a discussion about coverage. Uh, and then there's two color-coded charts that talk. It's, I guess it can be implied that that's the coverage issue. So I query, could you reread re the finding of fact that Joanna just commented on? I'm thinking that the application may have that type of allegation that there was uh, insufficient coverage. It has an allegation. Okay. Well, could you reread the finding of fact? Uh, it is the applicant has not demonstrated. The applicant has not demonstrated that a substantial gap in their wireless coverage exists pursuant to the Federal Telecommunications Act of 1996, 47 U.S.C. 332 C. 7 B. Little I. Two big eyes.
I think the point, the word substantial is there to qualify. All right, so all in favor of the final. All right, adopted five having. All right, so the um, deal of AT&T is denied. things after a certain time. So, well, we have three more. We have three more issues on the agenda. Our general rule is we don't take up anything new after ten. It's five of eleven. I I put it to the board what we'd like to do. Um, these will obviously go quicker than four hours. But um, I hope so. We find that the hours is quick. Um, just proceed. You say there's three on one. Three more. Do we want to set a time an overall I, I time mean, limit? I mean, I'm just. I, I understand. <laughs> I understand that they're much. They're much shorter. I understand that they're much shorter than the others. But I don't think anything is quick. And I think for us to give due consideration to everything, just based on my experience on the board for the past couple of years, quick might be 45 minutes to an hour for each, um, each remaining agenda item. And that puts us at midnight for one and beyond for more. So, I mean, I'm not, I'm not gonna make the decision myself, but we don't, we don't have 25 minutes and, you know, discussions and presentations generally. We could hear, but... I'm to go. There's at least one application. We'd be pushing on a lot. If we want to do two of the substantive ones, that's unlikely. But who knows how long that's going to be. At least one of them should be failed. Two. Let's commit to 11.30, and if we get done with one in 10 minutes? Right. Okay. Okay. So we'll just take up the next one. May, may I also suggest that we need to direct the yeah. dialogue. It'll be a very, very short mm -hmm. discussion. We'll do our best. All right. Um, the third one on here? Going home now. Should we say that if you're the third one on here? Yes. So the third. Put my agenda up. All right. So we've got. 
The request of Stephen Bornick and Graham Pillsbury for a variance to add living space over a garage that does not meet the required setback at 3 Ironclad Road. This was previously approved. Um, variance was approved by the Zoning Board, but the work was not started. It's um, a recording issue, right? So three, to hear the request of Russ Doucette, representing Doug and Allie Burke, to completely demolish and reconstruct a non-conforming structure <coughs> based on 19.4.3b3, and then to hear the request of Elizabeth M. Noft and Mary Ahern for a variance to add a front porch to their house at 8 Elmwood. I'm inclined to take one of my thought. Because I, I agree with you, I have my short time here. Any items that feel less than an hour, 45 minutes. So I just, so I, I mean, the, I the one that was. Go, a, I hate to go another 45 minutes or an hour. And then have you be sitting here? Yeah. More applicants sitting around the end. Yeah. What do we just got through it Number two is next in the order. It, it, it's pretty obvious we're not going to get to the last item. Um, why don't we do what Joanna said and, and just start, and there's a slight chance we get to the rest to set item. I'm, I'm sure they don't mind sitting here for an extra 15 minutes with the chance of being heard. <laughs> so, but, you know, okay. we'll definitely get to this one. We might get to the next one. We're definitely not getting to the last one. Okay. Um, Next order of business is to hear the request of Stephen Thank Bourne. you for hanging in there. Sorry. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> to hear the request of Stephen Bornick and Grant Pillsbury for a variance to add living space over a garage that does not meet the required setback at 3 Ironclad Road, map U08, lot 1A. This variance was approved by the Zoning Board on February 26, 2008, but the work was not started, so the variance is expired. Hi. Uh, my name is Steve Bornick. I live at 23 Old Colony Lane here in Cape Elizabeth. Um, the subject property, as you know, is three ironclad. Um, we are seeking the variance for a small increase in square footage, but based on the same footprint. So there's foundation already in place. It's been in place since the 1930s when the house was originally built. And we're just seeking to reopen or to re-approve this application that as you know, was approved in 2008, and uh, I believe it was originally approved. That was an extension. It was originally approved in 2007 uh, as an original. The plans are the same. There's nothing changed from that original variance request. And I don't know what else you need other than the submitted materials. Another question. Um, for the delay and for the non-recording, does someone want to, is it the owner, is, is there a reason for the delay? Uh, yeah, actually the owner was kind enough, I'm the prospective buyer, we're closing on the property next week, the current owner was kind enough to come to just support us if he, if he needed to. Um, he might want to explain that. I, That's enough, thank you. We want to, we're on yeah. schedule here. I would, Thank you. Yes, what? Hold I, on. I do have in my possession a purchase and sale agreement for um, Mr. Bornick and Mr. Pillsbury to okay. purchase the property for contract signed. Great. Thank you. I'm uh, Josh Hurley. Uh, uh, my wife and I uh, own uh, Ironclad. The uh, reason why we uh, uh, didn't uh, pursue it is that, uh, as you guys were, we had a real estate uh, uh, collapse <laughs> in. Uh, basically, when we uh, had a couple builders uh, put plans together, we went to the bank and the appraised value was much lower than what uh, would have been the cost. Uh, we tried two times. Uh, we had the original approval, then the uh, granting of the extension. Uh, both attempts, uh, we just couldn't uh, make the finances work on it. So we ended up uh, renting it out. Thank you. Uh, before we proceed further, I'm a neighbor to Mr. Pillsbury. Um, he lives down the street from me. So if there's a potential conflict, let me know and I'll stop by and quit. Thank you. I, uh, I, I received an email a few minutes ago that I, I think I should read. 
Okay. It uh, states, good evening, Mr. McDougall. My wife and I attended this evening's meeting in the hope of hearing this appeal and its potential impact to our property at Four Ironclad. We are not sure if our concern is applicable to this appeal. Unfortunately, we both leave for work early and simply could not wait for this item to surface with what appeared to be a never-ending radio tower discussion. Just prior to our purchasing this property, as in days prior, a deal was made between the Hearts, the owners of the owners of three ironclad at the time and the broker agent for the out-of-state bank handling the foreclosure on the previous owner of four ironclad. The deal was that for some financial consideration an expansion of the easement of the septic system for three ironclad on our property at four ironclad was granted. The original easement granted in the 60s was to enable the building at three to exist when its septic system could no longer function under code requirements. Aside from the somewhat hurried agreement by non-impacted parties, the heart's only intent was to make the property more saleable while on the market. The agents was one of many questionable but likely legal actions for profit. In any event, while researching the transaction to see exactly what impact the increase would be, I contacted the engineer of record and he told me he had no actual design based on any real engineering, but simply estimates on best guess assessment of the existing installation. Obviously at this point I have little faith in the paperwork and would appreciate you at least look into the project and require appropriate engineering to meet the requirements. The requirements of both codes and the intent of both the original easement and its change changes as to the approval of any expansion of the property of three ironclad. We recognize this issue may be moot, but appreciate your time and consider our request. Uh, if you want my quick summary of that, I think any arrangements for the septic easement are a private issue. And if, arra if arrangements were made with the owners of two properties before the sale, I'm not sure that's something the board would get involved with. Uh, in the last paragraph, they question the, the paperwork that was submitted and question the fact that there was no engineering done for the paperwork. And uh, we don't require you know, formal engineering plans for someone to come to the zoning board because that can be a few more thousand dollars that people don't necessarily want to spend unless the zoning board approves their project. So, my guidance to people is you need to give uh, a site plan and elevation so the zoning board understands what's going on. And then if the zoning board approves it, you know, you, you can spend the extra money on engineering. So I'm not surprised that there's no engineering for this project yet. But uh, I did feel due to the hour and these people said they tried to stay that that needed to be read into the record. There's no change to the septic on our end. And as part of our purchase and sale agreement, we were required to have a septic inspection. It was something we called for that we wanted because we wanted to make sure the septic was adequate and not clogged or whatever. It's a 15,000, uh, I'm sorry, 1,500 gallon tank, which is quite big for a two bedroom place. And the septic inspection passed with flying colors. So we were very happy about that. So it's really quite irrelevant to us. I can appreciate her concern, but there's no impact in that regard at all. Are there any increases to the number of bathrooms or the number of bedrooms or the size of bedrooms from the variance? There's an increase in size. That's what this variance is about. Mm -hmm. But it's for the a deck, right, on the third nope, floor? No, that's part of it. There's part of a deck. It's part of a second floor bedroom, just okay. to increase the size of the bedroom uh, and to increase the size of the first floor, which was more kitchen than anything else. So if I'm looking at the plans that show the floor layout, mm -hmm. is the dotted line the existing? And how do you tell the new from the existing? The dotted line would be the existing. Okay. So this second bedroom is new or is not new? 
Second bathroom, sorry. That's outside the dotted line. No, there are two, there are two, okay. ba two uh, bathrooms now. You're looking at the floor plan? I am. So is that second bedroom right now where the proposed walk-in closet is, or is it on the first floor? Or? There are no bedrooms on the first floor. Sorry, bathrooms. Bathrooms. I'm sorry. There is a full bath on the first floor and a full bath on the second floor currently. Mm -hmm. And so you'll be going to a kind of half bath on the first floor and two full baths. Correct. Well, a three-quarter bath and a full bath. Correct. But you, you did say it's an existing two-bedroom house currently. Correct. Okay. And according to septic capacity, it's, it's not a matter of how many bathrooms you have, but just the bedroom. These are identical plans from 2008. Right. Nothing has changed. No. Yeah. It, it, it was indicated on the application that you weren't going to do the roof deck. We wanted the option to be able to do it, but we weren't sure whether we were going to do it or not. Okay. I, I think the application presented reflects no roof deck tonight. So. No, the plans don't. There's no roof deck on the plans. Okay. I just want to make sure everybody's on the same page, roof deck or no roof deck. No, no, roof, no deck. roof deck is fine. So the it's not wasn't a real issue for us. Okay. So the original appeal was for the one the one story expansion and a roof deck, and they are mimicking those plans except they're eliminating the roof deck. They're doing the one story vertical expansion. Thank you. 
I, I did review the details of the of the older application as well. All I included in your packet was the variance certificate and the findings, but I, I did review the application and the details, and it was all consistent with, with the with, prior. With, with this, the two applications are consistent with the exception of the okay. elimination of the roof deck. Okay. Are we open for general discussion? Uh, let's first. Is there any public? Uh, any other? Yes, please, ma'am. Can you please step to the podium? Thank you. Um, Jackie Dennis, by Ironclad Road. Um, so we live in the abutting property. My, only, my real concern is last year when we applied for a variance to extend our garage, we had a new land survey done. And in fact, we have more land than we anticipated by several feet, and that land goes into the property of Three Iron Platt. And there's um, a stone wall that appears to be on the property of Three Iron Platt, but in fact it's on our property. These are not really big issues for us. We don't want to make a big issue of it, but we would ask that the new owners um, perhaps do a new land survey themselves, just to be sure where the lines of the boundaries are. And also, could we see a sketch at least of these plans, because I understand that the roof line is going up, and therefore if there are going to be additional windows, how will that impact us? It won't impact us a lot. We do not want to make a big issue, but we feel that we really should be allowed to see and clarify all these things. And it may not be tonight, but maybe it means that you just can't pass the variance in that we have. Sat we have That's the back side of three iron That's overlooking true. your property, That's overlooking your yeah, drive. That's where those nine little Correct. Six, so. so obviously it will overlook our property noise. I don't know if it's a big issue, but I think I would like to be able to really think about it, see what that means to us. And because that is about three or four feet from the edge of our property. You mean where you extended your garage last year? No, we didn't the extend it. The roof line? No, we did not. We haven't done it. We're going to be able to say it. Oh, you haven't actually got the applied for it. Yeah. Well, I don't know. I mean, I don't know the legalities of various things. Okay. So it's and so the impact in terms of viewing for the seat. I just need it to be able to see the That is. So how would that be? How does that impact the for me? Well, that. You know it's going more towards. Well, that wouldn't. Uh, it wouldn't impact the nonconformity. Okay. It, so that, they don't need to come to us for the windows anyway. Right. That, that provides some additional headroom, but uh, I went over this uh, with Mr. Pillsbury, and there was already floor area there, and so they could expand. They can expand that section of the house in that fashion without zoning board approval because they're only adding headroom. They're not adding floor area there. If they were adding extra floor area in a non-conforming area, that would be part of uh, this review. I just would like some note made of this, and I think I mentioned it because we did actually meet very briefly um, when they were having the appraisal done. 
that last year the people on the road paid for a new roadway and so we would just appreciate some consideration that there is a new roadway now there when they're doing their construction. It's a private road and we all paid a considerable amount, including the people that left earlier this evening. So, um, these are probably not legal things. I understand that, but I'd just like to make note of this in the appeal. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Any other public comment? All right, so we'll close the public comment and open up for discussion. Does the, when the board grants a variance, it's a temporary act. The, the variance is a property right, but it has to be uh, effective, or uh, what's the term? It has to be made absolute. And that's registration. So the failure to register, there is no variance. So we have to go through the process again, right? Or can we say that the variance is still active and the board can adopt the previous variance and reactivate it? I think this one was reported. I think it's just that they didn't do the work they needed to do in order to kind of check the variance. There was one that we were supposed to hear first that thing that was reported. not reported. Yeah, that we skip till next session. Right. Yeah, you've got, with a variance, you've got 90 days to record it, and you have a year to, to begin construction. And uh, on this particular one, it was recorded, but they didn't begin construction. So, so are you asking what the effect of not beginning construction yes. has Same. on yes. the previous, or the granting of the variance? So do they lose? Is it a null? But is, 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 the, is the variance voided? Mm -hmm. If it is, we have to go through the process. I think it is voided, but we can, to the extent the application is the same, we can have some level of confidence that it meets. Yes. I, I, would, I, mean, I would agree with that. I, I don't know if we can simply stamp it and say, are we, we, we can't sure, so bring it back. We, for our purposes, the original variance has been voided by operation of fact, law, whatever. Uh, and then we have to go through the process of 19.5.2. Uh, but we can use comfort. The, we can certainly take comfort in and, and use the zoning board's yep. granting of the variance in 2008 to streamline the process. And their application materials are fairly complete in terms of addressing the issues of criteria. Yes. Okay. Well, and, and Ben said that he's reviewed the prior, all the materials related to the prior grant of the variance. Okay. We just, we have the decision here, but he has reviewed the prior grant. Okay. Can we still ask questions? We can reopen. Yeah. Um, at that, the survey, I think, is uh, the building application. That then that's part of the remit for uh, what did the ordinance come into play? It's so close to the building envelope. That has to come into... Uh, that, that is correct. A, a survey will be required based on the new language in the zoning ordinance that requires a survey for projects. Thank you, Ben. And the applicant's already aware of that. Uh, I, I'm not sure. Uh, no, standard boundary is the language in the zoning ordinance. 
It can be the <coughs> the applicable line. Right then. Okay. Right. That's good. So it sounds like we're talking about a front step back, a step back from the front part of the boundary. Perhaps what we heard from the neighbor had to do with the side boundary, is that Um, if the footprints stay in the same, there should not be an issue with the survey. So if the survey comes back, then it's a problem. It's a serious issue. In other words, the house is in the wrong spot or the, what have you. That's what you were asking earlier about the survey? I was just curious about whether they were going to have to do a survey anyway or if they had already done one to address the public concern. I understand. And to ensure that the variants that we're issuing, which I'm assuming will be for the specific amount that they've requested, is then only for that amount, not more. So, for example, if they're requesting a front property line variance of nine feet from the required 25 feet to construct the second floor addition at 16 feet from said property line, and a left side property line variance of 19 feet from the required 25 feet at six feet from said property line, then the survey would have to establish that those numbers are compliant with. Sorry, I was reading from the old one, but I'm assuming those numbers still. It's uh, it if you if, if you look at the plot plan and hold it as a portrait, uh, the the road is on the right runs down the right hand side. So that's the frontage down down the right hand side, and that and then you see the 16 feet right in the structure, 16 feet to second floor addition. That that's the variance. It's the required setback is 25 feet, and uh, that needs to be 16 feet. Is that the only one that's being varied? That is the only one okay. on the, the rear and side setback are met. So it's the only one is the front from 25 to 16. Correct. No, I understand the application for the current front setback. Correct. Which elevation am I looking at? You see the steps on, on, the, on this plan? Mm -hmm. And then you can correlate with the steps on the construction plans. Even though the one with the steps is called the front elevation on the plans, that's really a side. Yep. So we're, sorry, we're varying what on the plans is shown as the right elevation. The left. That's the issue. So it's on the left elevation. Okay. 
right here. Gotcha. Okay. All right, guys. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the, the upper right portion of the left elevation is the expansion. The part that's kind of shown in the shading. Right here? This? No, the, the upper. But that existing, this existing front is all here, right? So there's already, it's really just the upper part, kind of a volume increase, right. not well, even before, really a... There, right. Okay, gotcha. Okay. The building today is four and a half feet from the property line. Correct. 16 feet from the property line, so away from the property And it would just be to the road side. Yeah. Any further discussion? I have none. All right. Close the discussion. Anybody have any motion? I move we approve the variance request from Matthew 8, Lot 1A. With the understanding um, that the new requirements of the ordinance will require a survey. I second that. I second it. All in favor? All right. Variance is approved. Five. Okay. Uh, findings of fact. Uh, this is a variance request for map U8, lot 1A, 3 Ironclad Road. Applicant Stephen Bornick and Graham Pillsbury. Additional findings of fact. Aaron Hurley is the owner of record of the subject property. The applicants are under contract to purchase the property. Two, three Ironclad Road is a non-conforming lot in the RA district. The required setbacks are 25 feet on the front property line, 25 feet on the side, and 20 feet on the rear property line. Three, a variance was approved by the zoning board on February 26th. 2008 that would allow this construction but is it ex it has expired four the proposed addition is 16 feet from the front property line and it complies with the side and rear setbacks conclusions there is no substantial departure from the intent of the ordinance and a literal enforcement of the ordinance would cause a practical difficulty as defined by 30 amrsa section 4353 4c we do the additional in the previous. In the previous ones, I think through two all. through six are included now in the definition of practical difficulty, but I could be wrong about that. Um, a little. We could just go to the ordinance too. What section is that? It's uh, 1952. And this is and when the following conditions exist. Mm -hmm. The language of the statute, or of the ordinance. 1954 and 52. 52? Five 52 five or 54? Five 52A? Five 52B? I mean, 54 is variances, but then it refers back to the board may grant. Oh, right. Eight. So yeah, we need to go through the other ones. And through. when That's the following conditions yeah. exist. All right, so it, I'll just read through these. Um, another conclusion two, the need for a variance is due to the unique circumstances of the property 
and not to the general condition of the neighborhood. Three, the granting of a variance will not produce an undesirable change in the character of the neighborhood and will not unreasonably detrimentally affect the use or market value of abutting properties. Four, the practical difficulty is not the result of action taken by the applicant or a prior owner. Five, no other feasible alternative to a variance is available to the petitioner. Six, the granting of a variance will not unreasonably adversely affect the natural environment. And seven, the property is not located in whole or in part within shoreland areas as described in Title 38, Section 435. So all in favor of the um, findings and conclusions? I have nothing. Thank you. Thank you for your patience. Next um, agenda item is to hear the request of Ross Doucette, representing Doug and Allie Burke, to completely demolish and reconstruct a non-conforming structure based on section 1943B3 of the zoning ordinance. The subject property is 73 Long Point Lane, map R3, lot 9Q. Mr. Doucette. Yes, thank you for allowing us to stay this late and try to get this done. <laughs> thank you for staying this late. Uh, in short, I'm here representing uh, Doug and Allie. Uh, they purchased a property on 73 Long Point Lane in Cape. Uh, after a further review of the property or the home, we deemed it uh, not feasible to remodel or to restructure it. Uh, if you look at some of the pictures, especially the foundation, uh, it's in pretty bad shape. I've been building for 30 some odd years, I don't think I've seen a foundation this bad. I know it's not conforming lot, but our plans are to demolish the house and put the, the new home in the existing spot, not moving it at all. Can I make a point? Yes, that's right. I, I did make Mr. Doucette aware that a survey would be required for this, and he did provide one. It's in the back of the additional documentation that I just handed to you. Prior to starting this project, uh, we did do our due diligence, and I did meet with Ben on numerous occasions to make sure that what we were doing was up to code and satisfactory to you people. Uh, he led us along the way, making sure that we had everything that we needed.
What is the increase? Pardon? What is the overall increase in footprint? Of the footprint? Mm -hmm. um, the existing house footprint as it sits right now is 1,393 square feet. It also has an existing deck that is 12 by 16, which is another 192 square feet of approximately 1,585 square feet. The new structure uh, is 1,743 square feet, which is 25%, a little less than 25% of the, the land cover. For the footprint and the height? The height is just under 28 feet from the highest ground level. And what about for the existing? The, uh, the existing is 22 feet, approximately. Am I right that on all sides but one, you're also decreasing the setbacks? All uh, sides but two, sorry. Mm -hmm. The back of the house, we're not increasing whatsoever. On the side, we're not. And on the opposite side, we're not. The only place that we're increasing is in the front. And we're increasing that by a couple of feet, but we're still within our 25-foot setback. OK, I guess I'm not following this plan, then. So on this page, which is page... It doesn't have page number. Yeah. Two, three, four, five, six. Page six of the plan set. Yep. Is this house, garage, and the little deck area the existing building? Yes, it is. And then this kind of parallelogram? That's a lot. It, oh, that's the lot. Correct. Okay, I thought that was the footprint. So what's the new, so this plan doesn't show the new footprint and then the lot? Yes, it does on the second oh. page on that next page. Oh, it's pages five and six. Okay, but there's nothing that shows. I thought this was this thing and this was proposed and then this was the lot. Okay. Yeah, we. Uh, it would be. We, we are in the shoreland for a small portion of the property, but there's there's no variance that relates to the shoreland overlay. So, we we've, we've been over this about a year ago, where in the the legal reading, or I shouldn't say legal reading, the literal reading of the ordinance makes it appear that we should be acting on this in the shoreland zone, but. The board found that that was somewhat absurd to do that because there's no variance required in the shoreland zone. The variance is to the base zone, or not the variance. The the uh, the, the discrepancy that we're dealing with is with base zone requirements, not shoreland requirements. So we, so so we remain in that section of the zoning. So we're we're in that section. Correct. Yeah.
is our right, anyway. Yes, it is. Can you describe where the where the increase in footprint is exactly? So it's if you notice on the page, uh, I'm trying to compare the, the existing to the, the proposed. So it, it looks like the new garage is. Correct. If you look at if you look at the, the first plot plan, okay, and, and look at the second plot plan, the second plot plan is the new house. Yeah. The house is identical. The garage is, is as I mentioned earlier, just a little bit bigger. Yeah. Okay. Sorry. About that. I missed that. Did you see the pictures of it? <laughs> That's the biggest reason why we're here. I'm sorry, I guess I'm not following these plans, and I, it may be the hour, and it may be me. Um, so the fifth one is the existing plan, and it shows only one of the setups, two. Uh, the first page shows you all the setbacks uh, of the, the existing home. My understanding. Yeah, so there's two arrows that kind of point at each other. The difference, the number over here is the distance between. Right. I'm glad you're the architect. In the non-conforming section of the ordinance, 25% 20, 25 uh, building coverage. Where this 
where, where this closest one here was 41 mm -hmm. in the front, I couldn't exceed the 25 for mm -hmm. the original setback, mm -hmm. which I did. Although that says 30, like 29.4. Right. To there. Right. So I, I exceeded that. I went a little further close to the 25 foot. Gotcha, gotcha. But that one's, that's 25 anyway, so Correct. not our. We don't care. <laughs> historically applied this chart, the chart of setbacks for RA to expansion? If I'm looking at section on page 34 and 35, there's the developed non-conforming lots, which I'm assuming this is. And then it refers you back to A one A. A sorry. Yeah. And the chart. Yeah, there, there's there's that section for for people to build with a under my review. Mm -hmm. And then there's the section reconstruction replacement. Thank you for reminding me because it's been a while. Which says they, they could have rebuilt this on the same footprint with only my review if they didn't increase the floor area. Mm -hmm. but, but they are increasing the floor area, which brings it to you guys for uh, needing the setbacks to the greatest practical extent. Maybe permitted, provided right? that's the tree construction of the compliant setback requirements to the greatest practical extent as determined by the zoning board appeals in accordance with the purpose of this ordinance. And then it kicks you back up to 1914 B2 to determine whether the, the replacement meets the setback to the greatest practical extent. B3. It says B3. It, yeah. it means relocation. But That's no, a, but it, a it, typo. It's a typo where it says refer to the additional criteria in 1943 B3. Right. Which is just above the second paragraph. Did we get any public comment on this? I did not receive any public comment. But it would have been noticed. Oh, yeah, it was yeah, noticed. Was noticed? Have you talked to any of the abettors? Uh, my client has been very diligent about meeting or trying to meet all the members of the association. I believe there's a woman here that is the secretary of or the vice president of the association. Uh, and he's talked to all of them or most of them. Uh, they're waiting for uh, uh, an association meeting. Uh, he's got great reviews from just about everybody. Just that we query whether we have any more questions for the applicant. Do you have any more questions for the applicant? <laughs> 
All right, having no other questions, uh, thank you, Mr. Doucette. Uh, any public comment? Can you please step up to the uh, podium? Thank you, sir. I'm Ed Perry. I own the uh, abutting property at 6 Tucker Lane. Uh, Doug Berker called me up. He sent me emails. I looked at it. Um, I, I don't uh, think it adversely affects in any of my situation on my property. And uh, if we have an association meeting where we have to vote on it, I would vote to approve it. So uh, I, li I like the smaller house, but they're following all the rules. And you know, someday I would like to do that to my house too. So I hope they wouldn't object if I did that on mine too. Thank you. Thank you. Any other public comments? I am Penny Pollard, Three People's Point Lane. Um, the Burkas have been very diligent in presenting their plans to neighbors and following the rules of the association and proceeding uh, under our internal guidance uh, for how to proceed. And as far as I understand, what's before you today is for the variance, and we have no, or I have no objection to what they're proposing. Thank you. All right, any other public comment? We'll close the public comment and open up for discussion. Start. I mean, it seems to generally comply with the requirements of the ordinance. We can yeah, obviously go through the uh, section 19.4.3.B.3. <clears throat> so again, what we're looking at is um, a reconstruction of a non-conforming structure, not in compliance with the limitations that it not increase the, squ the square feet of floor area. Um, so it may be permitted provided that such reconstruction is in compliance with the setback requirements to the greatest practical extent as determined by the Zoning Board of Appeals in accordance with the purposes of this ordinance. In no case shall a structure be reconstructed or replaced so as to increase its nonconformity. Not. I'm going to make a motion to approve the request of Russ Doucette, um, representing Doug and Allison Burka, to completely demolish and reconstruct a non-conforming structure based on Section 1943B3 of the Zoning Ordinance. Second. Anybody? Second. All in favor? All right. It's approved. Five nothing. Uh, findings of fact. This is a request. Number one, this is a request of Russ Doucette, representing Doug and Allison Perka, to completely demolish and reconstruct a non-conforming structure based on section 1943B3 of the zoning ordinance to the subject property of 73 Long Point Lane, map R3, lot 9Q. Doug and Allison Perka are the owners of record for the subject property. Three, 73 Long Point Lane is a non-conforming lot in the RA zone. There is currently a non-conforming single family dwelling on the lot. Additional findings of fact, one, the Zoning Board of Appeals has considered the size of the lot and the slope of the land, the potential for soil erosion, the location of other structures on the property and on adjacent properties, the location of the septic system and on other, and other on-site soil suitable for septic systems, the impact on views and the type and amount of vegetation to be removed to accomplish the relocation. Two, the proposed structure will not increase the nonconformity of the existing structure. Three, the proposed structure is in compliance with the setback requirements to the greatest practical extent. Four, the lot coverage in the Shoreland Overlay District is currently non-conforming and will not become more non-conforming. All in favor of those findings and additional findings? Any other findings? All right. Approved. Thank you. And thank you for your patience. <laughs> I have. Good luck next month.
Maybe we'll only have one thing. Yeah. How's it looking? <laughs> 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 <laughs>